Special Investigation Unit out of Detective Headquarters. The boss is Captain Didion. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Special Investigations Unit under Lieutenant Dan Bowser is composed of 16 officers drawn from the Detective Division. Its purpose is to work on any crime of sufficient magnitude or to assist on request any division in the city. 10 a.m., we were on our way to a meeting with a man who had been given the code name Black Ten. There was good reason to protect his identity. Black Ten was an informant. Fuzz radar is pretty good in this place, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. You ever been in this mine shaft before? I didn't even know it was here. Okay, what'll it be, gents? A couple of beers. You know what would happen if an inspector came in here with a light meter, don't you? Nothing. Too dark to read it. It's an old joke, fella. I'll serve friends of mine, and one more of the same. Joe, how are you, laddie? Bill? Calling a lot of attention to yourself, aren't you? Shows I got nothing to hide. Nobody's gonna badmouth the guy for having a friendly beer with a cop that busted him once. Twice. Whatever. Still, no need to give anybody the idea it's more than it seems. Right, laddie? Atmosphere. So now we get down to the nitty-gritty. Right. What's Lou Donovan doing these days now that he's out of the joint? Nixie, no shot getting this time. One race, one winner. Out of friendship. All right, what do you got? Al Baylor. Name's familiar. Never handled him, have we, Joe? No, but he's got a record for burglary. Been keeping out of sight lately? Not if you know where to look. You tell us. Behind the bar in the blue moon. Know where that is? Up in the hills off Barham. Wonder how anybody finds it, but I guess that's why it does such a good business. Great spot to take a girl you're not married to, get it? Yeah, we get it. Now, what about Al Baylor? He's wearing a ring on his pinky. Only finger will fit. Woman's ring. Yeah, go on. Piece of jade with diamond leaves all around it. Real nice workmanship. Retail, two big ones, easy. How much is he asking? 300 bucks, cash sale, no refunds. All right, describe it again. Do you one better than that, laddie. You see it, you'll recognize it. One of a kind. Oh, just in case you want it, Baylor lives about a mile from the bar, 721 Glen Canyon. Stick that in your pocket. I'll be on my way before people think I'm keeping bad company. Hold on, didn't you forget something? Like what? How much? No charge. And since when did you start giving it away? What's wrong with you guys? I do a favor and you start looking for a kicker. Because it's free, it's no good, is that it? Why for free? Call it friendship. Not for Al Baylor. For you, an old Joe. Nothing against Baylor. Like what? Like maybe he beat you on a deal. Maybe. But you don't think I'm holding a grudge, do you? I don't know. Aren't you? No. Not since I talked to you. on this house. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Much higher than most people. And what happens? I'm gone two days, and $25,000 worth of jewelry vanishes. 
Now, something's got to be wrong. Yes, ma'am. All right, Sergeant, you tell me. What is it? Smart burglars and careless homeowners. I can't speak for the intelligence of burglars, but I can assure you I am not careless. You said you were away when the burglary occurred? Yes, I was in San Francisco that weekend. According to the report, the burglar came in that sliding glass door, is that correct? Yes, and I can assure you it was carefully locked. And the house was empty at the time, was it? Yes, it was. Sergeant, what am I supposed to do? Stay home all the time and guard this place with a loaded shotgun? Joe, take a look. Here it is. That tiny little hole? Yes, ma'am. The burglar made it with a BB pistol held against the glass. Then he ran a loop of thin wire through the hole and hooked the catch. But that door was locked. I don't see what else I could have done. You might try laying a rod in the metal track at the bottom of those sliding doors. Even a length of broomstick will do. But a determined burglar would break the glass anyway, wouldn't he? Yes, ma'am, he might. But that could make enough noise to alert your neighbors. Where do you keep your jewelry, Mrs. Shearing? In a safe? Well, no. There's no safe in the house. I've thought of having one installed. But you've got a real good hiding place. Either it wasn't as good as I thought, or the thief had inside information. Could be both. There really aren't any hiding places, Mrs. Shearing. If you can think of it, so can a burglar. They know them all. In a drawer, behind books, in a grandfather's clock. Wasn't even hidden in this room. You have heat registers like this all over the house, do you? Most of the rooms, yes. Including your bedroom? Yes. Why? Woman over in Toluca Lake. She used to hide a box of her best jewelry in a register like that. The burglar found it. All right, Sergeant, you've convinced me they're smart, but I won't admit to carelessness. Anyway, didn't you say that they could have had inside information? Maybe. Now, did you tell anyone you'd be away for that weekend? No one. Absolutely not one person. You sure, Mrs. Shearing? It was an emergency. A girl I'd been at Mills with. Well, she needed a friendly shoulder, so I flew up on a minute's notice. Did you take the dog with you? No, of course not. I boarded her at the... Kennel. Yes, ma'am. So you told someone there when you were leaving, where to get in touch, and how long you'd be gone, right? But this place has taken care of Tutu all her life. I simply won't believe that of Dr. Giro. Well, now, we can't prove it, Mrs. Shearing, but there's a possibility somebody at that kennel is a setup man. He knows you, he knows where you live, and most of all, he's seen you wearing jewelry. You don't wear your finest pieces to a dog kennel. Just one ring or a brooch, that means there's more at home. And a good setup man can tell you how much you paid for it. I'm never going to get any of it back, am I? There's a chance, Mrs. Shearing, we're working on a lead. It'd be a help if you'd give us a description of that diamond and jade ring. It's rather hard to describe, Sergeant. It's so unusual. My husband had it made for me in Italy the year he died. It was my favorite. Well, maybe you could make a drawing of it. Well, yes, I suppose I could do that. I'm not much of an artist. You see how thoroughly you've demolished me. Ma'am? I'm careless. Burglars are smarter. Even poor little Tutu's partly to blame. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, should I? Well, how's that? She was a loser, too. Beg your pardon? She lost her little dog collar, didn't she? Thursday, August 4th. To obtain a search warrant, we had to present our information to the district attorney's office. This consisted of the burglary report describing the diamond and jade ring, the information given to us by Black Ten, and the two sketches of the ring. We assured Assistant District Attorney Paul Lemus that Black Ten was an experienced and reliable informant. 9.30 a.m., after we had specified the area to be searched, a hillside house where Al Baylor lived, and described the property to be seized, Lemus agreed to issue a search warrant. 12.30 p.m., the warrant was prepared and handed to us. Next, we had to find a judge who would consider the evidence and sign it. 2 p.m., Judge Leroy Eichenberg signed the warrant with the usual instructions to return it along with any evidence seized or a report on large items within 10 days. 2.25 p.m., we went to Parker Center and met with Lieutenant Bowser. We filled him in on what we had so far. Bill and I roughed together a plan. We told him how we'd like to work it. All right, you got hot socks and you're ready to roll. What more do you want, my blessing? That's right, and a policewoman. Tell me why. Well, we've never drawn a sour one yet from Black Ten, but we'd still like to eyeball that ring. Unless it's been sold, he'd be wearing it tonight, won't he? Yeah, if he's working tonight. You mean you haven't checked that out? No, we haven't. We thought a stiff call might tip him off. Now, if he took down the shearing job, he's got 25 grand worth of hot jewelry. He figures to be pretty hinky. And he's an ex-con, Danny. Couldn't make us before we got close enough to see the ring. And then you want a policewoman who could pass for a swinger. Well, that'd help break the silhouette, wouldn't it? Now, she should have three things. I think I've got the girl for you, just out of the academy. Rita Hanley, young, pretty. She looks good out of uniform. Those are the three. Four 
4.30 p.m., while we waited for policewoman Hanley to join us, we went over the record of the bartender suspect at the Blue Moon. He'd been arrested four times for burglary and convicted once. On the other three occasions, he had been acquitted or released for insufficient evidence. The package also contained several mugshots of the suspect, Al Baylor, including one recent one. Sergeant Friday? Yes, ma'am, that's right. I was told to report to you for special duty. Policewoman Rita Hanley. How are you? This is my partner, Bill Gannon. How do you do? I'm Joe Friday. Nice to meet you. I hope this is all right. They told me I was to come on like a swinger. But you look the part to me. You're sure now? You look fine. Wouldn't you say so? Hmm? Wouldn't you say she looks right? Oh, it's not for me to say, Joe. What do you mean by that? Well, I just don't feel I should give an opinion. I'm not qualified. Well, since when has that stopped you? Now, Joe, you know me long enough to know I never pretend to know something if I don't know anything about it. You want to run that by again? All I'm saying is I yield to you on the subject of swingers. You do, huh? You're the expert, Joe. I'm a married man. All right. I say she looks fine. That's good enough for me. I'm glad that's settled. Lieutenant Bowser says you're just out of the academy? Three months. You're still a probationer? Yes, I am. Then you don't have much experience. As a swinger or a policewoman? This is no amateur we're going after. Baylor's done hard time. He could be rough. You mean it's dangerous? Not if you're careful. I will be. Don't worry about me. How old are you, Rita? About 22? About. Why? I'm just thinking, at 22, you still got a lot of swinging ahead of you. To carry out our plan with the least possible suspicion, it was agreed Rita Hanley and I would go into the Blue Moon first. Bill would wait 10 minutes and join us. After we had observed the ring and were satisfied that it was part of the loot burglarized from the shearing home, we would make the arrest. 7 p.m. Good evening. Hello. Two of you? No, there'll be four of us if they can find the place. Look who's talking. Maybe they're already here. Do you have a Mr. Gannon here yet? I don't think so. No, not yet. If you'd care to wait in the bar, I'd be happy to show them in as soon as they get here. Fine, we'll do that. Thank you. What would you like? Double scotch in the rocks. A little rye on water, please. Very good. That wasn't right. I'm sorry. What? The drink. I made a mistake. You did fine. I did, and I can tell from your expression. It wasn't you. Then what was it? He's not wearing that ring. <laughs> in the 
the search warrant was shown to him. Then we drove up the canyon about a mile to his house. We started our search. Bill checked the bedrooms. They were upstairs. We checked for loose floorboards, crawl holes, and vents. We examined the closets, open boxes, drawers, luggage, and felt the pockets of old suits. We searched the furniture. 8.30 p.m. 9.30 p.m. We continued the search. Bill found nothing in the bedrooms. We were certain that the missing jewelry was not in the house. Bill searched the garage and the suspect's car without success. No luck if the stuff's on the premises. He's really found a place to stash it. That he has. What do you want to do? Well, he's got a record and he had stolen property on him. Let's book him. And he'll tell the judge he bought the ring from a stranger and we get thrown out in preliminary. Yeah, I know. So what's that give us? The jade ring. Mm -hmm. Worth 2000 didn't she say? That's what she said. Only leaves us $23,000 short. All right, fellow, let's go. Where are we going? Downtown. You're going to book me? That's right. Look, I told you how it was. I bought the ring. You searched the pad, you know there's nothing else here. Because I didn't get anything else. Who did you buy it from? I don't know. Just a guy came in off the highway. Look, is that all it's going to take? Just finger this guy and I'm clear? You suddenly remember a name? Not me. I think he mentioned it once, but it's gone. I was thinking of Jan. She was there drooling over the ring when I bought it. All right, who's Jan? Jan Petrie, hostess at the Blue Moon. Why don't I call her? Maybe she'll remember. One of you can listen on the extension right over there. All right. Jan, it's Al. Guess you heard what happened tonight. Yeah, I was busted. You know the ring I bought from that guy last week? Turns out it was hot. They're going to book me unless I can come up with his name. Do you remember it? Yeah, that's right, George something. But what was the last name? Neither can I. Well, I guess that's it. No, not a thing, unless you want to keep an eye on the place for me. You know, take in the papers, feed the fish, get the mail. What? Yeah, I guess so, but hold on. You taking me in right now? That's right. Yeah, right away. No, honey, you couldn't get here in time. What? Yeah, I'll leave the lights on for you. You just take care of things here. Right. Thanks. Anything on her end? No, she played it straight. Coming over here, though. Tonight? Yeah, in about 20 minutes. What for? Feed the fish, make sure everything's buttoned up. Think we ought to wait for her? Yeah, I do. What do you think? We haven't got much now. Rita. Yes, Joe. Do you want to get our unit out of sight? Park it down the street. When do you want me back in here? Keep your eye on the front door. We'll flip the porch light on and off. Right. Stay where you are. I thought we were going downtown. Not for a while. What are you going to do? Search the place again? We might. That's your warrant. But you're just using up a lot of time and energy. We got the energy banner. That's all? And right now you're fixed pretty good for time, aren't you? <laughs> Jan Petrie, the hostess from the Blue Moon, to arrive. We warned Al Baylor not to make a sound or to reveal our presence in any way. We waited 15 minutes. No one came. Nothing happened. We continued to wait. 10.45 p.m. Into it. Into what? 
I don't understand any of this. I'll hit the porch light for Rita. All right. All right, Miss Petri, what are you doing here? I just came to feed Al's fish to make sure everything was locked up. What do you feed him, diamonds? I don't know about any of this. Forget it, baby, we're nailed. Just leave me out. I don't know anything about this. Well, maybe what's in this bag will help clear things up for you, lady. You never would have found that stuff on your own. Is that right? You never thought to look in there, did you? You pulled the joint apart, but you never put your hand in that tank. I'll tell you something else. It's a good thing you didn't. Is that right? You better believe it. You know what kind of fish those are? Well, suppose you tell us. Piranhas. Red piranhas. Meat eaters. They'll attack anything if they're hungry enough. And I make sure they always are. Feed them only once a week. Raw hamburger. If you'd suck your arm in that water with the teeth they got, they'd have cleaned it off clear down to the bone. It's illegal to have those fish, isn't it? You get caught with piranhas, it'll cost you a fifty to a five hundred dollar fine. Well, don't you worry about it. What? We're not going to press that charge. How'd you do? Not too bad. Looks like we caught our limit. September 2nd, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of violating Section 459 PC burglary. Sunday's paper. Wanted sales personnel, 800 month guarantee, experience unnecessary, fabulous discount service, double earnings in a month, double them again in two, unlimited potential, earn over 100,000, proof available, win new cads and T birds. Phone Mrs. Horton Bonnie Bates, 93373. What's the old pyramid deal? Sound familiar? Horton Bates, didn't he work the same scam three, four years ago? That's right, looks like his wife inherited the scheme. Bates died of a coronary, didn't he, about a year back? Yeah, as a free man. We never could come up with anything more than 17,500 B&P. Slowed him down, but it didn't stop him. Yeah, that's about all a false advertising charge ever does. He was working something he called Creative Marketeers. Organized it in 63. Sold out for 140,000. Like the ad says, earn over 100,000. That's one of the reasons we couldn't lean on him last time. His lawyer used that as proof that the ad didn't misrepresent. Got another idea this time. What's that, Skipper? 322 PC, operating a lottery. More effective than business and pro. They applied it to a bunk case up in Washington. Got a conviction and it was upheld. Prove there's an element of chance, huh? Might work. I'd like to establish that precedent here in L.A. These pyramid deals are vicious. The victims are generally old people who put up their last dime or young ones who borrow to invest, thinking they're going to get rich quick. Like a chain letter. One person writes to two, two write to four, four write to eight. Before you know it, you've got a thousand people on the hook. And only the ones in early ever collect a penny and not much at that. Get on it right away. I want you to work full-time starting now. Yes, sir. Let's see if we can't knock a building block or two out of Bonnie Bates' pyramid. Bill telephoned the number given in the ad. Bonnie Bates' assistant answered. It was a short conversation, but a fruitful one. Naturally, they wouldn't give me anything over the phone. Said if I'd come to a meeting tomorrow night, I'd meet the great lady and walk out a rich man. Who'd you talk to? Says he's Bonnie Bates' assistant. Gave the name Everett Tottle. Where's the meeting? Brookfield Hotel, Corinthian Room. That's out of the high rent district. This Tottle guy said to bring three things to the meeting. Yeah, what's that? Love, faith, and an interested friend. Well, now, I don't know about those first two, but that last item you got... Tuesday, March 14th, 7.30 p.m. We left the office and drove over to West 5th Street to the Brookfield Hotel. 8.10 p.m. The meeting was underway by the time we reached the Corinthian room of the Brookfield Hotel. Everett Tottle introduced himself as the man who had spoken to Bill on the telephone, and he welcomed us with whispered enthusiasm. The meeting just got underway. You haven't missed a thing. Oh, that's good. Copies of the Dollar Wise Pledge and the Dollar Wise Song. You want to join in at the end of the program? Sure will. Thank you. Friends, look up here. Look up here and see who's smiling down on us. Horton Bates, my dear departed.
hearted husband. God rest his soul. God rest your soul, Horton. Smile down on us, Horton, dear. We're doing all kinds of good tonight. He spent his last years proving the things I say are true. I hold here in my hands a copy of the hundred and forty thousand dollar check he got in nineteen and sixty four. Good and faithful friend, brother Everett Tuttle, you tell the folks about Horton. All I can tell you folks is that I knew Horton Bates since I was a boy. We grew up making our money the hard way. Oh, I thought he was a dreamer until he showed me that check of his. Now I know he was a mathematical genius, folks. You tell them, brother. But they're not folks anymore, Brother Everett. They are brothers and sisters because we're all in this together. After I show you how to save money, I'm going to show you how to make it. How many of you pay retail prices for the things you buy? Did you ever buy a thing, then right after find it up for sale at almost half the price you had to pay? Yes! Did it make you angry? Yes! Did it make you mad? Yes! Did you feel that you were taken? Yes! Would you like to have it stopped? Yes! Well, that's what we're here to teach you. Teach you how to make it stop. S, T, O, P. Take this vacuum cleaner. Oh, you take it. I don't want it at that price. Fair traded, they say. Can't get it anywhere for less than $67.50. $41 through our dollar wise catalog. A $26.50 savings. Top brand mixer. Do I have to tell you what it cost? $37.90. The dollar wise price, $22. Signed, sealed, guaranteed, and delivered right to your door. $15.90 savings to our members. Is that a buy? Yes! You bet it is. Everything you'll want, brothers and sisters, at only 10% above the wholesale manufacturer's price. You tell me, dear hearts, is that buying power? Yes! I want to hear it again. Is that buying power? Yes! Well, I'm here to tell you that buying power is all well and good. But what about making power? If you ain't got, you can't get. <laughs> $300 a month working two spare nights a week? Who wants to make $600 for four spare nights? I do. Well, pay attention. I'm going to show you how. You see this tiny figure? $199.99. That's your cost of membership for 10 whole years. You give me this figure, I'll make you prospectors in the dollar-wise market service. Besides the great savings I've told you about, I'm gonna give you more money. And each new brother or sister you bring in, I'll give you $30 cash money. If each of those people become prospectors and bring in new members, I'll give you $4 cash money for each new member they bring in. Let me show you, friends, how easy this really is. Four prospectors a week from among your friends, relatives, and neighbors will put $544 into your very own pocket every month. In your lives, heard of so much free money. Free money, free money, free money, free money, everybody, free money, 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 
9.30 p.m., one thing you could say about Bonnie Bates, she was a great salesman. Is there something? No prospector can pan any gold without one of these. Sales promotional kit, 1995. That one hour reel of tape's worth the price. The Bonnie Bates sales pitch, recorded for posterity. 10.10 p.m. Bonnie Bates really had them rocking and rolling. Brother Black, stand up and let's talk wealth. When did we first meet? Last month, Sister Bonnie. Brother Black is a pharmacist. Drugstore, right around the corner. How much did you make your first week as a prospector? $260. What about the second week? $700. Oh, no. No, I lost one. Make that $660. Oh, you lost one, Brother Black. Oh, I am sorry about that. I am sorry. <laughs> Tell us about the third week. 840. That's $1,760 for the month so far. Thank you, Brother Black. And that's not counting overrides on merchandise. And the new members, his members, and his members' members are going to bring him. By the time his final tally for the month is in, he will have made $10,000 from our growing pool of dollars. 10.42 p.m. After eliciting testimonials from a number of successful members, Bonnie Bates made a big production out of paying off the old members. The new members crowded around to sign up. They couldn't wait to give her their money. Isn't Sister Bonnie wonderful? Yes, ma'am. This is my third meeting. I just can't make up my mind. How's that, ma'am? 199 doesn't seem like much to some people. But my land, it's almost $200. Yes, ma'am. Well, no sense being an old scaredy cat. Ma'am. Hmm? Can you keep a secret? Why, yes, I think so. Well, now I understand they're running a half-price special a week from tonight, part of the new membership drive. Half price? Well, that means I'll save almost a hundred dollars. That's right. Now, please don't spread that around, will you? <laughs> Cross my heart. Bless you, brother. Wednesday, March 15th, 10.40 a.m. We listened to Bonnie Bates' sales tape. We were fairly certain we could get a conviction on the false advertising charge. We brought in Nick Gowers, one of the department's statisticians from Information Services, to help with the lottery angle. He said he'd go to work on it right away. 12.45 p.m. Just talk to the city attorney. Yes, sir. Buster. One ten p.m. Bill and I arrived at Corinthian Hall with a warrant for Bonnie Bates' arrest. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bates. This is exactly what I was looking for. You know, I'm a salesman by trade, and I think I can do pretty good bringing you new prospectors. Indeed you should, brother. And as I told you, you can become a manager with the profits you'll be making as a prospector. I don't know how to thank you. Try calling this number in about an hour, fella. I don't understand. Police officers, Mrs. Bates. We have a warrant here for your arrest, charging 17500 BNP code, false advertising, and Section 322 PC operating a lottery. No, now, gentlemen. Better just stand quiet, mister. <laughs> What's all that mishmash? All those fancy numbers you're throwing around there. Funny thing, Mrs. Bates. What's that? The jury's going to want to know the same thing about you. <laughs> Monday, May 15th, 9.30 a.m. Trial was held in Division 69 of Los Angeles Municipal Court. Deputy City Attorney Hal Davies handled the prosecution. Bonnie Bates was represented by Palmer Forrest. And that's when Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon appeared at the hotel and placed Mrs. Bates under arrest. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Your witness. No questions. At 9.38 a.m., Bill was called as the next witness. Davies began laying the groundwork for the false advertising count. Do you, of your own knowledge, know of anyone who got a salesman's job without paying a fee to Mrs. Bates? No, sir. You ever hear of anyone obtaining such a job? Objection. Sustained. 
Well, to the best of your knowledge and belief, did anyone get a salesman's job without paying the defendant? No, sir, they did not. Thank you. You witness. No questions. He's sharp. He doesn't want to prejudice the jury. He knows he can't beat the false advertising rap, so he's saving his edge for the lottery count. <laughs> Ten twelve a.m., Bonnie Bates' tape sales pitch, which she had recorded live at one of her meetings, gave an accurate picture of the meeting which we had attended. The court listened to the full hour. If it please the court, I waive cross-examination of this particular, uh, witness. <laughs> <laughs> 11.16 a.m., I was sworn in next. Davies concentrated on the lottery angle. And so it's called a pyramid because of the way the membership spreads down and out? Yes, sir. Well, how rapidly does the membership multiply, Sergeant? Quite rapidly. You might call it a geometrical progression. Does anyone make money out of it? Only those who get in at the very beginning. Like Mrs. Bates? Objection. Overruled. If it please, Your Honor, the prosecutor is leading the witness. It's been established that Mrs. Bates started the dollar-wise marketing service. You may answer the question, Sergeant Friday. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me repeat the question, Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. Would Mrs. Bates be one of the few to make money out of this pyramid scheme? Yes, sir. That's correct. Does anyone lose money? Yes, sir. The majority who join late and are at the bottom of the pyramid. Well, what determines who wins and who loses? Objection. The term win presupposes the element of chance. I'll rephrase the question. What determines who makes and who loses? Well, that would be impossible to tell. Why is it impossible to tell? Well, because it's just a matter of pure chance. That's all. Thank you, Sergeant. Sergeant Friday, what's the formula for determining the square of a number to the ninth power? I wouldn't know, sir. How would you chart the incidence of recurrence of digit X in a field of 73 variables? I couldn't answer that, sir. So you are not an authority on the mathematics of geometrical progressions, chance, probabilities, and applied calculus? No, sir, I'm not. Oh. You use the term geometrical progression. Isn't that correct, Sergeant Friday? Yes, sir. Well, that's my mistake, isn't it? What's that, sir? Well, I assumed you knew what you were talking about. That's all. Nick Gowers appeared as a witness in rebuttal. Using charts prepared by the police department cartographer, he showed his simplified proof of the element of chance in Bonnie Bates' pyramid operation. There was a sudden change in the jury's attitude. You're a statistician, are you not, Mr. Gowers? Yes. And your job is to gather statistical material for the police department's information services section. Is that right? That's right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. The type of mathematics in your work is primarily adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Isn't that so? Primarily, yes. The kind of math we all learn in high school. Is that right? That's right. So you are not a mathematical authority on chance and the laws of probability. Is that correct? I may not be an authority. Are you or are you not an authority on chance and the laws of probability? No. No further questions. Eleven forty-three a.m. The defense placed its group of character witnesses on the stand for Bonnie Bates. They spoke about the money they made and the reverent feelings they had for the Dollar Wise organization. Forrest was still drawing them out when court was recessed for lunch. Two thirty p.m. Bonnie Bates took the stand. Under Forrest's expert direction, she wasn't selling promises of profits to prospectors. She was selling faith to the jury in Bonnie Bates. And then they come and accuse me of lottery. Well, I'll tell you how much I know about lottery. I thought they meant playing bingo at the church. <laughs> I don't take money. I give money. And when I give, other people receive more than they've ever received. It's like I've said and lived by all my life. Yes, Mrs. Bates? It is more blessed to give than to receive. After an hour on the stand, Forrest turned Mrs. Bates over for cross-examination. Hal Davies took over. Mrs. Bates, I'm going to ask you again. Were there any prospectors or managers who didn't make a profit? I always say, if a member of Dollar Wise can't make lots of money, then he sure ain't no prospector or no manager. Were there some who lost money? Mr. Lawyer, 
some people can do two things at once. Well, I'm not one of them. I have all I can do to keep track of all that money I'm handing out. Your Honor, this witness is just not responsive. I must caution you again, Mrs. Bates. Just answer the questions. Well, I'm trying, Your Honor. Lord knows I'm trying. Mrs. Bates, isn't it true that you and your deceased husband were involved in a venture called Creative Marketeers? Objection. Sustained. If Your Honor, please, I intend to establish a connection. Mr. Davies, one case at a time, please. Now, directing yourself to Mr. Gower's chart, isn't it true that the levels of membership could never really go beyond the first few levels? Oh, no. No. With good, honest work and God's help, it could go on and on and on and on. Right on through the 12th, 13th, 14th, even 15th levels? Absolutely, Mr. Lawyer. No more questions, Your Honor. And now, if it please the court, the defense would like to call its expert witness, Dr. Edgar Peter Sundstrom. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. Would you please state your full name, Doctor? Edgar Peter Sundstrom. And Dr. Sundstrom, you are a professor in quantitative analysis at the University of Southern California. Is that not correct? That is correct. You are also an acknowledged authority on the laws of chance and probability. Is that also not correct? My contributions to that field are regarded by some as significant. And you have been present throughout these proceedings, have you not? That's correct. And do you feel, with the evidence that has already been presented, that you can structure a feasibility analysis based on Mrs. Bates' operational plan? In other words, determine if it will work as Mrs. Bates has said it will. Yes, I have all the uh, data that I need. Fine. Dr. Sundstrom, please consider this question carefully. Is it theoretically possible for Mrs. Bates' plan to work? Theoretically. Theoretically. There's no doubt in my mind that it is theoretically possible for Mrs. Bates' plan to work. Thank you very much, Dr. Sundstrom. Your witness? Just hold on. I think I can lock the barn door. Doctor, I understand you say that Mrs. Bates' plan is theoretically possible. That's correct. Would you consider it practical? Engineers are experts on practical matters. I'm a mathematician. I understand. Just one more question. You heard Mrs. Bates testify that the levels of membership could go right on through the 12th, 13th, 14th, even 15th levels. Now, to reach the 12th level, how many members would it take? For the operational plan to succeed, the base of the pyramid must be broad enough, have sufficient membership interested in the service feature only. Excuse me, doctor. Would you tell us in numbers? Certainly. For the plan to work, it would require at least a minimum membership of 360 million people. Dr. Sundstrom, are you familiar with the Census Report? Census Report? Yes, uh, according to the Census Bureau, the population of the United States. What would you say that figure is? I don't know, precisely. Well, as close as you can come. I'll take round numbers. Well, I'd say about 200 million people. About 200 million people in the United States? Yes, sir. Well then, Professor, in order for Mrs. Bates' pyramid scheme to work, it would take a total of 160 million more people than the entire population of the United States. That is exactly correct. have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 17th, trial was concluded in Division 69 of the Los Angeles Municipal Court. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of operating a lot. Of we're flooding the area. Uppers are amphetamine sulfate tablets, a dangerous personality destroying drug. It was up to us to choke off the flow. We'd been searching for a lead for weeks. It was beginning to look hopeless.
9.40 a.m., patrol division had picked up a user. Lieutenant Bob Kennedy brought him in to see us. Howie Frazier here's got something to say. I'd like you to hear it. He's charged with possession, amphetamine. He's been given his rights. Don't make it sound so big. This is the first time I've been busted. Yeah, but not the first time you've ever flown with co-pilots, huh? So what? Everybody does it these no, days. No, Howie, not everybody. Meaning you? Meaning most of your generation. Yeah, sure, the squares. Maybe they're the smart ones. Think about that. I'll do it sometime. Do it now. Possession's a felony. You'll have plenty of time. In a cell? Not me. How do you figure that? I'm not some dumb dumb. I've got it all worked out. You have. I knew I could bust it someday. I figured the odds. That's why I did something about it. Tell us what you did. I made sure I always had something going for me. An ace in the hole. And you're going to play that ace now, is that it? Maybe. If you sweeten the pot. What's that mean? I told you I've never been busted before. I don't want to be busted now. You already are. Tear up the ticket. Oh, no, not today. You haven't heard what I've got to say. That doesn't matter. You've been arrested and booked. Nothing changes that. I've heard hundreds of stories about the deals you guys make. I don't know anything about the stories you've heard, but we make no deals. Now, listen. I don't have a record. My slate's clean. A judge will take that into account. But I still go to jail? I'll be locked up? It's possible. Boy, I thought I had it all laid out. I'm even hoping you'll think what I've got is important. We'll let you know. All right. I tried to find out the name of the guy who sold me the uppers, but I couldn't. He never slipped. So I did the next best thing. What was that? He drives a white Dodge. I followed it. I know where he went. I memorized the address. What is it? 3245 Ascot Street. Is it important enough to put down? What was the license number? XBI 804. Is it important? Maybe. It's a lead. More than you got now. Well, I don't know. He could be just another small-time pusher. Yeah, but one thing's sure. Pushers get their supply somewhere. Yeah. Somebody makes the pills they sell. a.m. The man we were looking for had to be a big-time operator in narcotics. We didn't know if Howie Frazier's information would lead anywhere, but we ran it down. We drove over to the Ascot Street address. It was located in North Hollywood. Just a minute, ma'am. What do you mean, just a minute? What do you want? Who are you? We had the same question. We're police officers, lady. Oh, well, I'm Thelma Benstead. I guess this looks sort of funny to you, doesn't it? Yes, ma'am, it does. Well, this is my house. I own it. I guess I have a right to break into it whenever I want to, haven't I? Yes, ma'am, if you own it. Well, I do. I waited until the lease ran out before I came over. I made sure I wasn't violating anybody's rights. You had the house leased, is that it? That's right. Two months ago, I notified the tenant I wasn't going to renew, that I wanted the house back. I've got a niece that wants it. I never received a reply to my letter, and I didn't receive a reply to the second one I sent either, or the third. So today, when the lease expired, I came over and found all the locks had been changed. Now, you can prove you own this place, can you? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Who is the tenant? He said his name was Smith. Oh, I know. I didn't believe him either. But if he wanted to lie about his name, that was his business. He paid the rent in advance every six months. That satisfied me. You haven't told me why you're here yet. We came to see this Mr. Smith. But he's not here. You think I'd be breaking at my own door if he was? Mind if we go in with it? Mind? I'll mind if you don't. As long as you're here, you might as well be witnesses in case I have to sue him for damaging the place. Come on. My goodness, it's a factory. Yes, ma'am, it's that. Just look at this place. It's all covered with some kind of powder. What in the world are they making in here? We've got a pretty good idea, Miss Benstead. Now you stay right here. Amphetamine sulfate. Looks like commercial grade. 100 pounds in that box. Here's the cutting material. Milk sugar. Lactose. Commercial type mixer. Portion control scales. And the pill machine. Single stroke type. Machine like this will produce 90 pills a minute. At street prices, that's about $770 an hour. Now, you figure 100 pounds of amphetamine sulfate and roughly 500 pounds of milk sugar. You'd have to have a computer to figure the size of the return. Amphetamine empties. Yeah. Plenty of them. Here's the shipping desk. I'd say there's about 700 pills in this bag. $100 worth. Well, here's your answer. Look at this. He didn't even open them. What's that, Miss Benstead? The letters I wrote to him, telling him I didn't want to renew the lease. Look at them right here on this clipboard. You got anything? All addressed to occupant. Now, Miss Benstead, we'd like you to tell us everything you can about this man, Smith. I did. He came to sign the lease, paid the rent six months in advance, and went. I never saw him again. Did he give you a first name? Yes, he did. Michael. Michael Smith. What about the next six months' rent? 
He mailed it in cash. Could you describe him for us, please? Well, he was about an inch or so shorter than you are. Age 50, graying hair. It's difficult to describe him. He looked like so many other men. Anything unusual about the man? Anything at all you can remember about him? No, not that I can think of, except that he seemed very nice at the time. I had no idea he'd do something like this, make pills. Narcotics, aren't they? Dangerous drugs. Now, how was he dressed? Well, it was more than a year ago. I just don't remember. He was a handsome man. How do you mean that, Mrs. Benstead? Well, just that. He wasn't good-looking, but he looked good. For his age, I mean. Especially in that car of his. What kind of car? Oh, I don't know anything about cars. It was one of those good-looking ones, you know, real sporty. It wasn't white, was it? White? Uh, I don't think so. Well, it might have been. Or, or silver. It was some real light color. I'll call SID and get a stakeout team on the way. Right. Well, at least we've done some good, haven't we? We've closed down the pill factory. Yes, ma'am, but that's only half of it. Oh? Now we've got to find the man who ran it. I instructed Thelma Benstead on the methods of police procedures in a case of this nature. She agreed to cooperate. One ten p.m., the latent Prince man arrived, along with two detectives. We briefed them, and they proceeded with their jobs to print and secure the residence. The gray-haired man in his 50s, not much to go on. Uh, looks like we got two possibilities. He'll come back to make more pills so we keep a stakeout on the place. And we check out the license number of that white Dodge. One twenty p.m., we ran a check on the license number. DMV told us it was registered to a Fred Watkins, 1612 Sycamore Street, North Hollywood. That's right. I hope you're not selling something. You woke me up. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Oh. Well, come on in. What'd I do, run a red light? You own a white Dodge license number XBI-804? Well, yeah, it's downstairs. What's the matter? Something happened to it? Somebody hit it? It's all right, as far as we know. Well, what's the trouble, then? What are you here for? You lease a house at 3245 Ascot Street, do you? No, I live here. You know anybody at that address? I don't even know where Ascot Street is. Your car was seen there. Couldn't have been mine. Oh, it was yours. You're kidding. It was followed there by one of the people you sold amphetamine to. Amphetamine? What's that? What do you do for a living, Fred? I'm retired. What did you do? I repaired radios. Worked at it for 30 years. Started back in the days of the old Crosleys, Atwater, Kents, Farnsworths. Those were real radios. Well-built, well-designed. Nothing cheap about any of them. They didn't have transistors in those days. Just tubes as big as light bulbs. That meant heavy chassis, heavy transformers. And we didn't fix them by simply slapping in a new part either. We fixed the old parts. I wish I had a dime for every RF coil I rewound by hand, every IF I rebuilt. Yeah, those were great radios in those days. Uh-huh. Is this one of them here? One of the best they ever made. Nothing like it today. How's it sound? Good, real good. Doesn't work, though, not anymore. It's just a memento. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem to know all about radios, Fred. What do you know about pills? What's a cartwheel? I don't know. How about a whitey? I never heard the term before. Both are street talk for amphetamine sulfate tablets. I told you. I don't know anything about that stuff. How about Thelma Benstead? Who's she? She owns that house over on Ascot Street. Oh, look, I haven't got anything to do with any house on any street. Ever been in trouble before, Fred? No, I haven't, and I'm not in trouble now. You sure about that, are you? You bet I'm sure. I haven't done anything, so you can't prove I have, no matter how hard you try. What if we want to search this place? It wouldn't worry me. In fact, go ahead. You got my permission. Fine, but listen to this first. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Now, do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Sure, I understand them, but I'm still giving you permission to search the place. Start in here. Start in the bathroom. Anywhere you like. All right, Fred, fine. We'll start with your radio. Radio? Why bother with that antique? I don't know. Anybody who keeps an old-time radio without repairing it just doesn't figure to me. I didn't have the parts. You can't buy those tubes anymore. I told you I just hung on to it as a keepsake. A lot of memories there. <laughs> Is that right? You're wrong about one thing, Fred. Not many memories in these.
3.30 p.m., Fred Watkins was taken down to Parker Center. Mug shots were taken, and we requested the photo lab to give us a high-speed rush in the hope that the landlady, Thelma Benstead, could identify him as the man who leased her premises. We checked with R&I. Watkins had no previous record. Now, look, you won't find anything in my stuff, and I ain't gonna say anything, and you can't prove anything. We can prove one thing right now, possession. Well, sure, but that's all. And I got no record, so I'll get a suspended sentence. Now that we can tie you in with that factory on Ascot Street. You won't. Go ahead and try. You won't get anywhere. We think we might. Who'll say so? Somebody who says he saw me drive there? So what? I was visiting. I went to the wrong address. I stopped to ask directions. All right, Fred. Who's Michael Cooper? What? Michael Cooper. Who is he? I don't know any Michael Cooper. Well, now, he wrote you a check. $200 worth. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. He's a guy I loaned some money to. Maybe he's the one who makes the pills. Maybe we ought to check him out. You'll be wasting your time. Well, now, we got lots of it, Fred. Suppose you tell us where we can find him. I haven't got any idea. Got that Ascot Street address, maybe? He hasn't got anything to do with it. Well, now, somebody you? does. Suppose you tell us who. <sighs> sure, sure. All right. I do. You leased the house? That's right. For the purpose of making amphetamine sulfate tablets? Yeah. Tell us about the big man. What do you mean, big man? I don't know any big man. All right, man. Fred, your partner then. I got no partner. I ran the place myself. You mean the entire operation was yours? You ran the whole thing? That's right. All your own idea. Look, I said it was my setup, didn't I? I said I ran the whole thing myself. You bought the machines. You ordered the drugs. You did everything. Yes, I did. I did all those things. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Oh, we might, except for one small thing. Yeah, what's that? The man who set up that factory now, I doubt he'd be stupid enough to stash a bag of tablets inside a radio. Now, what do you think? Joe, see you a minute. Just got back from the Benstead woman's apartment. Show her the mugs. How we doing? We're batting zero. Yeah. She swears Watkins is not the man she rented that house to. says he's responsible for the whole operation and you don't buy it. That's right. Okay, let's say you're right, and I think you are. That brings us to the next question. Why is Watkins willing to take the fall? Well, he hasn't got a record and convicted he'd pull a light sentence. You think he wants to take the rap for somebody else? That's what we think. Possible it's done often enough. We think Watkins and whoever he works for had it all arranged, just in case we tumble to the factory. Watkins serves a light sentence and gets a big payoff from somebody. Yes, sir, that's how we see it. Makes sense, but it raises another question. Who does he work for and how do we find him? Any ideas? One, maybe. Might pay off. What do you got in mind? So far, there are only two other names connected with this deal. Smith and Cooper. And Smith doesn't take us any place. That's right. But Cooper's different. Maybe. Watkins had a check from him in his pocket. It was drawn on a downtown bank. They gave us his home address. You run it down? No, sir, not yet. But we did check R&I and DMV. Michael Cooper drives the kind of car the Benstead woman remembers. A silver gray charger. Go on. And he has a record of previous H&S violations. Sounds good, but you'll need more to tie him in. Yes, sir, but it's a start. If he's the man behind that factory, knocking it over won't sting him too bad. Yeah, we're ahead of you. He can always set up another one. 10.40 a.m. Michael Cooper lived in a Beverly Hills penthouse. His houseboy told us he could be found at a private tennis club. It wasn't hard to locate Cooper. Everybody seemed to know him. <laughs> Excuse me. This is your Michael Cooper. That's right. New members? Well, welcome to the club. Let me buy you a drink. No, sir. We'd like to talk to you. All right. You're at the bar, folks. On my tab. Yes? We're police officers, Miss Cooper. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you. Shall we sit down? I think I deserve a break. I played four sets this morning. Yes, sir. You know, great game, tennis. Keeps you young. No better way to stay in shape. You can keep your vitamin capsules and your pills. Good, clean air, regular exercise. That's the way to a full life. Yes, sir. You know the great people, tennis players? That's because it's a social activity that requires great diligence. Attracts the right kind. You seem to have a lot of friends. Oh, it's just a title. I was elected club president last month, purely an honorary position, but it is gratifying. Now, gentlemen, I know you didn't come out here to discuss tennis with tennis players. Tell me, what can I do for you? You know a man named Fred Watkins? Of course I do. And I'm sure you know that. You wouldn't be here otherwise. There's no need to be coy. I believe in being perfectly frank with everybody, and I like people who return the compliment. When did you see Watkins last? Oh, uh, seven or eight days ago, we met for lunch. But I talked to him on the phone this morning. I intend to provide legal counsel for Fred. Tell us about the house on Ascot Street. What do you want to know? You don't deny knowing about it? 
Uh, certainly not. Why should I? I've committed no crime. That house was used to manufacture drugs. Do you know that? Amphetamine tablets. I know. Fred told me that this morning. I was absolutely appalled. You'd think a man Fred's age would be wiser. If I'd known that's why he wanted the house, I never would have signed the lease. You put the lease in your name, did you? That's right. I had to. You see, Fred, unfortunately, has a long record of bad debts. You'd be sure the owner of the house would never have run it to him. You were just doing him a favor, is that it? Precisely. That's your story? Of course. It's the truth. You paid the rent. You also wrote him a check for $200, is that right? That's correct. Are you wondering why? Well, there's an excellent reason. Fred and I were in the Army together, and on one occasion, he saved my life. After that, of course, we became the best of friends, and we've been that way ever since. Always ready to help each other whenever the occasion arose. In short, gentlemen, I'll do anything for Fred, and he'll do anything for me. He can go to prison for you. Why, yes, now that you mention it, I'm sure he would. Now, do you have another question? I'm sure I have an answer for it. You use the name Smith on the lease. Why? Well, it's my legal name. No, it is, really. Michael Cooper Smith. I got dreadfully tired of so many raised eyebrows each time I used it. I became simply Michael Cooper. But let me assure you, Smith is still my legal name and the one by which, under law, I must sign all legal documents. Everything's strictly legal. Of course, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I know you wouldn't. Friday, November 7th, 4 p.m. Three days had passed. So far, our investigation had turned up only one disproving fact. Neither Cooper nor Watkins had served in the Army. Joe, Bill, I'll give it to you straight. I just got back from the DA's office. While you were out in the field, I got a call from the county jail that Fred Watkins felt targeted. I went over to see him. He gave me a full cop-out. What do you have to say? According to Watkins, he talked Cooper into loaning him money. He also talked Cooper into renting that house for him. But Watkins set up that factory all by himself. Leaving Cooper in the clear. If that goes before a judge, Watkins will be convicted of everything he confessed to. He'll establish the fact that he was the only one involved in setting up that factory and the only one connected with its operation. And you know what that means. Yes, sir, we do. But have one fine time connecting Cooper with the crime afterwards. And even if we did, I can hear his lawyers now. They'd say one man had already confessed to the charges we were bringing against Cooper. They'd point out one man was already convicted on those charges and was serving time as a result. That's it. If the evidence we had was strong enough, we might get a conviction, but it wouldn't amount to much. Cooper would be out on the street in no time. Free to set up another pill plant. We need that evidence now, Joe, today, before Watkins goes to trial. We need to slam the cell door on Cooper before Watkins pleads guilty, not after. Watkins goes to trial in ten days doesn't give us much time. I know, but it's all we've got. Make it do. Work around the clock. Retrace every step you've taken. Talk to all the witnesses again. Search that house a second time and a third time if you have to, but get that evidence. We've already gone over the house with a fine-tooth comb. Only got one thing to say to that, Gannon. What's that? Get a finer comb. November 8th, 4.10 p.m. We searched the house on Ascot Street again. The machinery and other things were scheduled to go to property division the next day and be held as evidence. Anything? Not a thing. We've gone through this entire joint three times. Yeah, I know. It doesn't figure, does it? What's that? Oh, everybody makes mistakes. Cooper's no different. You're forgetting something. Yeah, what's that? He might never have been here. It's still his operation. Want to hit the bedroom again? No, whatever it is ought to be right in this room. I keep telling myself the same thing, Joe, but I don't believe me. See something? Maybe. Take a look. Manufactured by Furby Limited, Orange, New Jersey. Yeah, but that machine's years old, Joe. Could have been resold three or four times. Yeah, but that hasn't. Looks like a new motor. It's just been repaired October this year. Acme Electric, Armatures Rewound, Princess Street, Santa Barbara. Well, somebody paid to have that work done. There'll be a name on the bill for the job, won't there? So far, so good. What now? Those empty bags. We've already checked them two times. Let's make it three. 5.40 p.m. We checked 674 bags. Again, we found nothing. 775, 770. Wait a minute. What's that? Oh, just some trash that was in there before. Let's check it. Looks like somebody emptied a couple of ashtrays. Some bottle caps. Pieces of paper. Looks like a torn up calendar page. Some writing on the back. What's it say? Can you read it? One bag. And it looks like part of the word amphetamine. Let me know that. Get the rest of those pieces. Let's see if we can put something together here. Yeah, there's another one. Here. This one over here. That's all there is, but it's enough. Using blender, mix one bag amphetamine. 
the formula for uppers. And it's going to give us one more ingredient, isn't it? Whoever wrote that formula. Monday, November 10th, 11.20 a.m. We turned the formula we found over to SID. Officer Tom Evans, their handwriting expert, was ready to give us his findings. Any comparison? See for yourself. Compare the A in dollar with the A in amphetamine. Notice the shading in each. Notice the pen lift before each starting stroke. The overlap of the upstroke and the final downstroke in each. Now look at the D in dollar and the D in blender. See the loops in the vertical strokes? And notice how the downstrokes fail to reach the horizontal plane before making the starting stroke of the next letter. The same thing happens with the eyes in mix and the signature. The downstrokes fail to reach the horizontal. Also, both resemble inverted Vs, and the fact that neither has a dot is significant. What's your conclusion, Tom? I'd say the check signed by Michael Cooper and the formula were written by the same man. Joe, Bill, Tom, Lieutenant. Tom's made his comparison the handwriting checks. In my opinion, it could be argued. It won't be. Take a look at these replies to your wife. New Jersey, Furby Limited reports selling a number of used machines to Michael Cooper Smith. Santa Barbara, Acme Electric repaired a motor for a Mr. Michael Cooper. That does it. We got a case. Only one more thing we need. Michael Cooper Smith. Pick him up. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 5th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the accused, Michael Cooper Smith and Fred C. Watkins, guilty on two counts of violating Section 11911 of the Health and Safety Code, possession of dangerous drugs, and guilty on two counts of violating Section 11912 of the Health and Safety Code, manufacturer of dangerous drugs. The penalties for such violations are terms in the state prison of not less than one year and not more than three. Yes? Miss Hurley? That's right. Who are you? Police officers. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, well, it's about time you got here. Yes, ma'am. We'd like to see Miss Rarick, please. Oh, I don't think you can. The ambulance man's with her now. Giving her something to calm her down. Poor thing certainly needs it. We'd like to see her, please. Told you, don't know if you can. Have to ask the ambulance man. Yes, ma'am. If you'll just let us talk to the attendant, please. Well, you just wait here. I'll talk to him. We don't like to be rude, ma'am. This is a police investigation. I wonder if we can see Miss Rarick. All right. Your feet. Ma'am. Your feet. Wipe them off. You ain't gonna come in here with dirt on your shoes. Where's Miss Rarick now? Back there in the bedroom. Tell me what you know about this, Miss Hurley. You just bet I can. You just bet. That poor girl back there and her father lying at death's door because you didn't do your job. You know that. Ma'am? At death's door. You're supposed to see that things like this don't happen. That's what you paid for. And look, just look what happened. Both of them all beat up. Just don't understand what the world's coming to when things like this can happen. Well, first, ma'am, there was no way we could stop this. I think you understand that. We're trying to clean it up now. We're going to need your help to do it. Now, if you just tell me what happened. Well, that's what you say, but I know different. Now, look, Miss Hurley, the faster we can get started on this thing, the better chance we have of getting the people responsible for it. Well, what do you want to know? If you just start at the beginning, please, and tell me what you know about it. Yeah. Well, it started this morning, about 7, 7.15, I think. I heard this noise at the back door. What kind of a noise? Mm, kind of a scratching and a moan, tiny little moan. It sounded like it was way off, kind of in the distance. Yes, ma'am. I got up and went to the back door, opened it, and she was there on the porch, just laying there, looked awful. Just wasn't no task at all to see she'd been beat up. Yes, ma'am. I came back in here and called the ambulance, then I went back out to see if I could help her. Tried to tell me what happened, how they'd beaten her father. Where they'd hit her, she couldn't talk too good. I see. About that time, the other car got here, the one with the men in uniform. Yes. They looked around, then they went over to the other house. That'd be the Rarick house. That's right, next door. I see. Joe? How is she? Pretty bad. Can we see her? The attendant says for a couple of minutes, no more. They're going to take her to Georgia Street. Okay. I'll get it, Miss Hurley. All right, thank you. Yeah, just got word from Georgia Street. Yeah, girl's father. What about him? Dead on arrival. (laughs) 
8.22 a.m. We continued the questioning. Just that there were two men. They came in, beat up on her. That was enough. I see. One look and you could tell she was hurt bad and her an invalid. Just don't understand how anybody in their right mind could do a thing like this. Just don't understand it. Yes, ma'am. You say she's an invalid. She and her father were in an auto accident a couple of years ago. Some drunk ran right into him, smashed the car all up. Laid Mr. Eric up for a couple of months and put Patricia in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Yeah. Poor little thing. Can't walk at all. Must have crawled over here. Don't know how she did it. Great courage. Great courage. Yes, ma'am. Now, did you hear anything at all last night? What do you mean? Well, a disturbance of any kind. No. Went to bed about 10, slept like a rock, didn't hear a thing till this morning. You said that was around 7? 7. 7.15. 7. But you didn't hear anything before that? No. You know if there was anyone that the Rericks were afraid of? Anybody who might have a reason to do this? Can't think of a soul. How about money? Did Mr. Rarick keep large sums around the house? Well, now I don't know for sure. He might have. Joe? Yeah. Excuse me. You gonna want to talk to me some more? Yes, ma'am. We'll be back. You want to see her now? Yeah, we'd like to.
the surrounding ground were gone over. In the soft earth under the bedroom window, a pair of footprints was found. Plaster casts were made of them. 12.15 p.m., Frank put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Miss Rarick had been given emergency treatment and had then been removed to the county hospital. According to the doctors in attendance, it would be some time before we'd be able to talk to her. 1.30 p.m., we began to canvass the neighborhood. From the people in the surrounding houses, we found that Mr. Rarick had retired from the wholesale grocery business about 10 years ago. He devoted himself to the cultivation of prize roses and the care of his daughter. The neighbors told us that the Rarick's were quiet and that they seldom entertained. 3.15 p.m., we went back to talk to Miss Hurley. I knew you'd be back. Ma'am? I knew you'd come back to talk to me. Could have told you a lot, but I thought that I'd just let you try and find out for yourself. Didn't do too well, did you, huh? Did you? I don't think I understand, Miss Hurley. Simple. Anything you want to know about this neighborhood, you come to the source. That's me. Anybody knows what's going on around here, I do. Well, now, if you had information we could use, ma'am, why didn't you tell us before? Didn't want to. Now, look, Miss Hurley, this is a murder investigation. A man has been killed and a woman's been badly beaten. We're going to need all the cooperation we can get. I'm ready now. What's that? I'll cooperate. What do you want to know? All right, fine. First off, do you have any idea who might have done this? You just bet I have. All right, who? That kid. Only one that's mean enough to do it. Only one. Who's that? Herman Jr., Mr. Rarick's son. You just bet he's the one. Why do you say that? Because I know that's why. He's mean. Always had trouble with him. Because the only thrash there ever was between Patricia and me. Troublemaker. That's what he is. Pure and simple. A troublemaker. How old is the boy, Miss Hurley? 28. Real monster. Do you know where he is now? No, and I'm not interested. Happiest day of my life was when he moved out of the house. Oh, he and I used to get in some arguments. A little brat stand there and think he was so big. Finally, Mr. Rarick saw it, told him to get out. Moved right out of the house, bag and parcel, right out. Now, you mean that Rarick and his son had arguments, is that right? See, that's what I mean. No wonder people don't cooperate with you. Ma'am? I say something, then you ask me if I mean it. Of course I mean it. Wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it. Like people who ask what time it is. You tell them, and then they ask you if you're sure. If they don't want to believe you, why'd they ask in the first place? Yes, ma'am. Now, about the arguments. You gonna let me tell this my way, or aren't you? Go right ahead. Well... All right. Anyway, like I told you, this kid used to go out of his way to cause trouble. One day, he tore up the whole bed of his father's prize roses. Three days before the big show, too. That was the end. Never did hear such arguments. Of course, they always had little quarrels, but this was a doozer, real loud. Thought that maybe Herman Jr. was going to hit his father. Sure looked like it. Were you there at the time? Well, no, I wasn't. Warm night, just a couple of months ago, I was out in the garage. Just couldn't help hearing what was going on. You know, houses being so close together. You can understand it. Yes, ma'am, we can understand I don't like the way you said that, young man. Well, I didn't mean anything by it, Miss Hurley. Hmm. Suppose not, but I don't want you to get the idea I'm the nosy type. No, no, not at all. Well, anyway, Mr. Rarick told that kid to get his things and get out, right out that night. Told him it was about time he tried to make it on his own. Said he was tired supporting a no-good, worthless bum. Those were his exact words. No good, worthless bum. Real fight. I see. Well, now, did the boy leave that night? Oh, yeah. Went right into his room, in fact. Uh-huh. Said he'd never come back. Didn't want anything more to do with the old man. Then his father told him he was going to cut him out of his will, not leave him a bare face time. Well, you can just believe that's when the trouble really started. Now, where was Miss Rarick all this time? In her room. But she came out, wheeled herself right into the room, told him to stop the foolishness. She always kind of pampered the boy, you know. Think myself, that's what caused him to be like he was. Yes, ma'am. And that's when Herman talked about doing something. Said the old man was senile, said he was crazy. That the money was his and he was going to see that he got his share. Yeah. Said he was going to get it if he had to kill somebody. <laughs> Ten p.m. We got the full name and description of the boy from Miss Hurley. We went back to the office and ran the name through R and I. We found a Herman R. Rarick Jr. with a record listing three arrests for drunk. We checked out his last known address, an apartment on South Hill, and we found that he'd moved several weeks before. The landlady gave us a forwarding address. Six ten p.m. Frank and I drove out to see Herman Rarick. It was a large apartment hotel in the Westlake area. We talked to the desk clerk. Sure, I know Herman. Nice guy. Once in a while, he gets a little loud, but most of the time, he's a real nice guy. I see. Is he in now? I don't think so. Let me look. Oh, here's his key. I think he went out about an hour ago. Wasn't feeling too well. Bad hangover. You got an idea where he might be? Oh, I didn't talk to him. Just saw him go out. Mm -hmm. You know what he does for a living? Herman? Yes, sir. Don't think he does nothing. Plays the horses a little bit. Picks up a buck that way. Good player. Sure knows the dogs. He's given me a couple of tips. Didn't do any good, but he sure does all right. Made a real killing yesterday. Must have hit it for about four or five thousand. Is that right? Yeah. Showed me the money last night. Real big roll. 
least four, five grand. Tips he put out to me never did any good. Can you tell us where he was last night? Say, what's this all about, anyway? Herm done something? Be a little better if we talk to him. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you guys know what you're doing, huh? Yes, sir. You want to know what he was doing last night, that right? That's right. Well, I can tell you. Really tied one on. Of course, with that luck, I don't wonder. He really tied one on. Sir? Loaded. He got in here and had a bottle. Say, you won't say anything about this to the management, will you? No, sir, we won't. Couldn't have that happen. They don't approve of drinking while I'm on duty. You understand, kind of stuffy, but that's the way they look at it. Yes, sir. Like I said, old Herm rolls in here, and he's got this bottle. Asked me to have one with him. Well, I don't like to get him sore, so I do. Then we have a couple more. I see. Sat down over there on the couch. I read aloud from the encyclopedia. What was it? Encyclopedia. I'm going through all 23 volumes, maps and all. That's nice. Training for a quiz show. Volume 5 now. Time I get through, I'll know the answers to every question in the world. Gonna win me a mess of money. Yes, sir. Now about last night. Read aloud whenever I can. Remember it better that way. Yeah. Now, what time was Rarick here? Uh, let's see. I guess 7, 7.15. Did he go out after that? Sure didn't. Oh, her. That boy can really put it away. Killed the bottle. And right while I was reading to him about cement. About what? Cement. You know, how they make it. A lot of pictures in here. Reading to him about cement, and he fell asleep. Yeah. Well, he didn't really fall asleep. Passed out. Yeah. Cold. Right there on the couch. Cold. Is that right? Yes, sir. Old Herm didn't go any place last night. Eight twelve p.m. Herman Rarick returned to the hotel. We checked his shoe size and found that it was not the same as the print found at the scene of the murder. Frank and I talked to him for about an hour. We questioned him about the money that he'd suddenly come up with. He explained that he'd won it at the races. He gave us the name of the man who'd accompanied him to the racetrack. We checked with him and found that Rarick's story was true. 10.46 p.m. I called the office and found that we'd gotten a message from the county hospital. Miss Rarick was able to talk to us. She wasn't completely out of danger, but barring a relapse, she was expected to recover. Frank and I drove out to the hospital and talked to her. I wish I could help you more than I have, but there just isn't anything else. Can you give us any kind of a description at all? No, I didn't get a good look at them. It was dark. I guess I was so frightened I wasn't looking for anything. I see. Now, did either one of them use a name at any time? I don't think I know what you mean. While they were there, did you hear one of them call to the other and use a name? Not that I know of. I'm pretty sure they didn't. Can you give us any idea of how tall they were? That'd be pretty hard to do. I could only guess. I'd say maybe as tall as you. I don't think much taller. How about their build? Was it heavy or slight? I can't be sure. I guess if I had to say one way or the other, it'd be medium. The one was very strong, though. Ma'am? Yeah. The one that carried me into the closet, he was strong. Just lifted me out of the wheelchair and carried me over to the closet and threw me on the floor. Did your father have any large amounts of money in the house? Yes, he did. He never did believe in banks. Not since the crash. Always said he could take care of the money as well as they could. I see. He had all his savings in the house. He kept it in the mattress on his bed. Do you know how much he might have had? I'm only guessing, but I'd say maybe two or three thousand dollars. My father didn't discuss finances with me. Always thought it was a man's business, but I shouldn't have to worry about it. I tried to tell him I tried all the time. What's that? To put the money in a bank. I see. He used to tell everybody he had it, and I don't think that helped any. Who did he talk to? People in the neighborhood. He used to tell them he didn't get the interest the bank paid, but he always knew where his money was. He used to ask them if they could say the same thing. Can you think of anybody in the neighborhood who might do a thing like this? No, we've lived in the same place a long time. No, none of the neighbors would even think about it. I see. Did you and your father have any enemies? Anybody that you had any arguments with? No, there wasn't anyone. I see. Mr. Friday? Yeah? Does my brother know about this? Yes, ma'am, he does. He's outside in the hall right now. He'd like to see you. The two of them never did get along. I tried to make them understand each other. I tried so hard. It didn't seem to do any good. Is there anything else you can tell us? There's one thing I kind of hate to mention. It seems so silly. What's that, Miss Rarick? Well, when they were arguing with my father in the next room, they got very loud. I thought I recognized one of the voices. I'm not sure. But at the time, I thought about it. Yeah. Then when they came into my room, I was pretty sure. But maybe I'm wrong, and I don't want to cause anybody trouble. I wouldn't want to make a mistake about a thing like this. Well, now, who do you think it might have been? It sounded like Smokey. Who was that? Smokey. 
He used to do some work around the yard for us. Does he still work for you? No, the last time I saw him was about a year ago. I haven't seen him since then. Would you know where we can get in touch with him? No, I don't. What's his full name? I don't know. That's why I thought it might be a little silly. I don't even know his right name. Just told us to call him Smokey. He's a young man. Yeah. Can you give us a description of the man? Oh, yes. Nice looking. I hope I haven't made a mistake. I don't want to cause any trouble for him. Well, don't worry about it. What? You didn't cause it. We continued to talk to Miss Rarick. We got the description of the handyman who worked for her father. 11.28 p.m. We went back to the city hall and ran the name and description through the moniker files in R&I. We came up with one good possible. In checking his record, we found that his full name was Charles P. Roxford. His age was listed as 26 years, and the rest of his description matched the one we'd gotten from the victim. Roxford had an arrest record listing several charges of forgery, and at that time, there was an outstanding warrant on him for check passing. We went back to the office and called forgery division. Yeah, Roxford, that's right. No, Charles P. Roxford, R-O-X, that's it. What's that? Well, no, we want to talk to him about a killing out on Brighton. Well, when was that? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, we'll be here. Right. Thank you. Well, it goes like that sometimes. What do you mean? They know where he is? Yeah, he's in jail. Charles Roxford had been picked up by officers in forgery division while he was trying to pass a bad check. They were talking to him when we called. The suspect was brought to the homicide squad room where we questioned him. He'd admit nothing except his name and that he'd been trying to pass a phony check. You're off your rocker. You got me for one thing, hanging paper. That's it, and there's nothing more you can make out of it. How about the money we found on you? Yeah, how about it? Where'd it come from? I won it. Where? In a crap game. Where was the game? I forgot. It's a floating game. Moved around a lot. You worked for the Rarick family a year ago. I don't know. Might have. I worked for a lot of people. You worked for them? Like I said, I might have. They seem to think you did. So they're right. What's it mean? You ever had any arguments with Mr. Rarick? No, we got along good. Never had no trouble. His daughter thinks different. That's so? That's right. And she's off her rocket, too. Look, maybe you guys got all night, but I haven't. You aren't going anyplace, fella. Well, how about booking me, then? Let's talk about it in the morning. That's fine with us, Roxford, as soon as you answer a few questions for us. I told you all I know. Maybe you forgot something. Let's go over it again. Okay, where do we start? You tell us what you've been doing the last few days. Any one day in particular, or do you want a rundown, minute by minute? You just tell us what you've been doing, will you? Well, now, let's see. This is Tuesday, isn't it? Wednesday morning. Big deal. Let's start with Monday. All right with you? All right, get on with it. I got up in the morning about, uh, I think it's about 10.30. Lit a cigarette, then I got dressed and went downstairs and had some breakfast. Interesting. Go ahead. I can spice it up for you if you want. Kind of dull when you tell it straight. You just tell the story when you get it straight. What are you guys trying to prove? What are you trying to tie on me? What'd you do last night? Had dinner and went to a show. Where'd you eat dinner? Place down on Spring. Did you eat alone? Yeah. What'd you do then? I went to a show. Who went with you? Nobody. I didn't say anybody went with me. Oh, I must have thought you said that. Yeah. I went alone. Where'd you go after that? Walked around, had a couple of drinks. Where? Bar down on 5th. What time was that? Around 12.30 or so. Anybody with you? No. You know the bartender? Never went in the place before. Well, then you got no way of proving you were there, have you? No, I have to. That'd it help. Why, I'm a big boy now. I don't have to explain anything to you guys. Get off my back, huh? I'm getting sick of playing footsie with you. Where'd you go after you left the bar? I went home. Where's that? Place over on 4th. What time did you get in? I don't know, 1.30, 2. The desk clerk see you come in? No, he was asleep. How long ago did you say you worked for the Rarics? I didn't. You said it was a year ago. Was that right? I guess so. I forget. Why? What's this about them, anyway? You got any way of proving where you were last night? I don't have to. That's the way it looks to you, mister. Look, you're in trouble if you don't come up with an alibi we can't break. That's right. That's right. Why? Because Miss Rarick got a good look at you. She couldn't have. The lights were out. All right, Roxford. Tell us about it. Come on, Roxford. All right. I should have known. I never should have done it. But I didn't have any choice. Well, you can figure that, can't you? What do you mean? I owed this money. The guys are getting tired of waiting. They said I had to come up with it. I didn't have a choice. Isn't that right? Sure, you can see it, can't you? I had to come up with the money. I tried to win it back. The more I played, the more I owed him. There wasn't any other way. I knew the old man had it. It wasn't doing him any good. I needed it. I knew he kept his money in the house. Who was with you? Jackie Forbes. You know where we can find him? Yeah, I'll tell you. Want to get the stenographer? Right. Sure, don't know. There wasn't any choice. 
There wasn't any other way. Why'd you kill him? He knew who I was. No choice. I had to kill her. Is that right? Well, sure, you can see that yourself, can't you? I had to have the money. If I didn't pay these guys, I'd have been in real trouble. Yeah. You know, they'd give me all kinds of trouble. What do you got now? December 10th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. The jury made no recommendation for leniency. People die in Los Angeles every day. A lot of people get married. A lot get divorced. When a marriage falls apart and it happens here, it's a job for lawyers. When it doesn't, sometimes it's part of my job. I carry a badge. It was Tuesday, March 24th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. The boss is Captain Hugh Brown. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We were working late. We heard an ambulance shooting call on the air, code two. We were in the vicinity, so we drove over to check it out. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. What's his name? Carl Hamlin. Locked. He has a gun. He said he was going to kill himself. All right, come on, Hamlin. Open up. You have another key to this door? No, I don't. All right, let's head it. It's no use. Is there another way into this room? No, this is the only door. How about windows? What? Is there a window in the room? Oh, yes, off the porch. You want to show us? He came in here drunk and caused a scene. The shade is pulled down. Yes, ma'am. Here, here's a knife. as long as you get to him. Cruiser unit, I'll tell him to stand by. Right. Hurry, please hurry. Watch the glass. Is he still alive? I can't tell. That'll be the ambulance. Will you show him where this room is? Oh, yes. Must have wanted privacy real bad. Looks like he got it. 38 Colt. One round fired. He's in here. I'm his wife. Let's roll more. Hey, 
He's dead. May I have his full name? Carl Hamlin. You have a middle name? Martin. Age? 43. You live here? No, we, we have a little house over on North Bronson. 947. Do we have to go through all this? That's all, Miss Hamlin. Here's your day away, slip. See you later, Friday. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if I use your telephone, Miss Hamlin. Yes. It's all so wrong, Carl, being dead. It's all so wrong. Would you like to go in there and sit down? Would you like us to call your family doctor for you? I've already called him for my mother. He'll be right here. Where's your mother now? In the bedroom. She's lying down. This, this whole thing has been such a shock. I understand. When I talked to our doctor, he said for me to give her one of the pills he's prescribed. Supposed to make her sleep. I see. You're going to have to talk to her? Yes, ma'am. I hope you won't have to do it tonight. She's not too well. We'll try to avoid upsetting her. I'd appreciate it. I released the cruiser unit. All right. Now, Miss Hamlin, there are a few questions we have to ask you, if you feel up to answering them. Yes. Do you want to tell us what happened? Well, Carl came over tonight, drunk, and caused a big scene. Your husband doesn't live here, then? No, no, we're separated. I see. Anyone else here when it happened? Oh, just Mother and myself. Anyone else living here? Just the two of us. All right. What time did Mr. Hamlin get here? I'm not sure. I, I was asleep. Beg your pardon? I was asleep. You weren't expecting him, then? No. Last time I saw him, I told him to leave me alone. I, I said I'd get a court order if I had to. Yes? Well, we've been separated about a week this time. Is that right? Well, there have been other times. This was the worst. I, I told him I was finished, that I didn't want anything more to do with him. Would you go on, please? Well, he's, he's been calling here and, and where I work. and Most of the time, he was drunk. He kept asking for reconciliation saying how sorry he was and, and asking me to take him back. Yes. Oh, I'm not blaming it all on him. I, I know some of it was my fault. Yes, ma'am. But he, he called this afternoon and, and said, he, said he had to see me, had it all worked out so we could get back together again. Yes, ma'am. Well, I told him I didn't want to see him. I, I said for him to stay away. I came home and told Mother about it and said Carl might come over tonight, and that if he did, I, I didn't want to see him. Yes. I kind of half expected him to show up, but, but he didn't. And, well, I went to bed after the 10 o'clock news, and Mother stayed up to read. Yes, ma'am. The first I knew there was anything wrong was when I heard the shot. I got up, and I came right downstairs. Yeah. Well, Mother was standing in front of the study door. She told me that Carl had locked the door and, and that he'd shot himself. I see. I tried to call to him. First, I thought he was playing some kind of a, a joke. Yes, ma'am. Well, Mother said she'd heard Carl fall down in the room. I, I called you right away. Anything else, Mrs. Hamlin? No, that's all. All right, Miss Hamlin, we'd like to talk to your mother now. She's over 60, Sergeant Friday. A thing like this isn't easy to go through at that age. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Carl and my mother didn't get along. He's always said that she caused the trouble between us. Told me a couple of times that if she'd kept her nose out of our business, we might be able to get along. I wonder if we could talk to her now. Oh, do you have to? Yes, ma'am. We'll try to be as brief as possible. I'll go see. Thank you. I made the notifications. Yeah. Well, as soon as we get a statement from her mother and the coroner shows up, we can take off. Yeah. Want to stop by the house on the way home? Eileen bought a bunch of stuff for me at the delicatessen. Is that right? Make you a real good sandwich, bottle of beer. Yeah? Head cheese and bologna on garlic bread, a little mayonnaise, horseradish, mustard. How's that sound to you, Joe? I'll just have a bowl of soup at the apartment. Thanks, anyway. Just don't see how you can sleep nights the way you eat. Mother, these men want to ask you some questions. My mother, Mrs. Gaynor, Sergeant Friday, and... Uh... Gannon's my name. How do you do, ma'am? How do you do? A couple of things we have to know, Miss Gaynor. Now we'll try to be as brief as possible. Mother, if you get tired, just tell them. They'll stop. All right, dear. What time did your son-in-law get here tonight, ma'am? I'm not sure. I think it was about 11.30. Yes, ma'am. Nora told me Mr. Hamlin might be coming over. But that time of night, you'd hardly expect anybody to come calling, would you? No, ma'am. He did. He always was doing something nobody else did. I think he just sat around and tried to figure things to do that was different. Yes, ma'am. Like tonight. He came in drunk. He yelled about how he wanted to have a showdown. 
I didn't know what he was talking about. Yes, ma'am. Started to yell at me. Told me how their breakup was all my fault. Started to curse at me. Yeah. I'm 62, Mr. Friday. I've seen lots of things, met lots of people. Isn't anybody who can talk to me like that. I told Mr. Hamlin, told him to get out of the house. That's when he pulled his gun out of his pocket. He pulled a gun? Had it right in his coat, outside pocket. Yes, would you go on, please? I told him. I said, Mr. Hamlin, you just stop this foolishness and get out of here. That's what I said. Yes, ma'am. He looked at me and said, yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Those are the exact words. And then he told me how he was going to kill himself to just show me. Go on, please. I thought it was some kind of dramatics. Mr. Hamlin was that kind, you know, always play acting around. Yes, ma'am. Not this time. Next thing I know, he ran into the study and locked the door. After that, there was a shot, and I heard him fall down. And right then's when, when Nora came into the room. He went into the study, and you heard the shot, is that right? Yes. Then I heard him fall on the floor. All right, Miss Gaynor, I think we have everything we need. Okay, if I go back to bed then? Yes, ma'am, you go ahead. All right then, Mr. Friday. Yes, ma'am. Anything more you want to know about Mr. Hamlin, I'll tell you. Well, I don't think there'll be anything else. Thank you, Miss Gaynor. If there is, I'll tell you. Yes, ma'am. I'll be in my room, Nora. All right, Mother. I'll be right there. She's taking a lot better than I thought she would. Yes, ma'am. Miss Hamlin. Yes? Did your husband ever mention suicide before? Oh, yes, several times. Matter of fact, just this week. I thought he was being dramatic again. I didn't pay much attention to him. It was so hard to tell if he was drunk or if he really meant something. I see. All the years we were married, I don't think he was ever really serious. He was this time. a.m. The police photographer arrived at the house and took pictures of the room. The coroner removed the body to the county morgue. 1.37 a.m. Bill and I left the Gaynor house and returned to the office. 2.03 a.m. We filled out the DB report listing the death of Carl Martin Hamlin as suicide. The body would be posted at 10 a.m. the next morning. Wednesday, March 25th, 11.15 a.m. We got a call from Ray Murray in SID. He wanted to see us. Ran the normal checkout this morning. Fired a test shot in the Hamlin suicide revolver. Checked it against 38 cold unsolved murders. Weapons clean. Your case isn't. What do you mean, Ray? Take a look at this one. Yeah, six left, 38 cold, so? Picked this one up in the corner this morning. I was there when Hamlin was posted. Yeah? Lodged in the back muscle near the spine. Slug's good and clean, no damage. Passed between the ribs. What are you getting at, Ray? Be my guest. Uh, I was expecting a quarter. And I handed you a penny. A bad one. Six right. Automatic ammunition, isn't it? That's right. Nine millimeter. What do you think, a Luger? Either that or a Browning. Both are common. Yeah. This fellow Hamlin pulled a pretty neat trick, didn't he? He sure did. He killed himself with a bullet that couldn't possibly be fired from the gun he was holding. Yep. You two better tear up your reports on this one. No suicide here. Yeah. You gotta find a murder gun. Eleven thirty-two a.m. Bill and I, along with Ray Murray, drove out to see Nora Hamlin, the victim's widow. From the physical evidence on hand, the way the door had been locked, and the fact that the window had been bolted from the inside, it appeared unlikely that anyone could have left the room after Carl Hamlin had been shot. However, from the information we'd gotten from Ray Murray, there had to be another weapon involved in the killing. It was 11.44 a.m. when we got to the house on Whitmore Drive. Oh, I didn't expect you back. I wonder if we could come in, Ms. Hamlin. Well, yes, of course. Mrs. Hamlin, this is Ray Murray from our Scientific Investigation Division. Mr. Murray? How do you do? We'd like to take another look at the study. Oh, why? We'd like to check it again. Well, all right. If you need me, I'll be in the living room. Thank you. Well, right in here is where we found him, right? Mm -hmm. You can see where we had to break this window to get in. Yeah, I see. Body was lying along here, head down there, 
Feet about here. About on the line of the sofa, huh? Right. What about the gun? It was near his right hand. Was the gun in his hand when you found it? No, no. Near his right hand. The pictures in the photo lab will bear that out. Uh, even if it wasn't for the variance in the slug zone, none of it adds for two cents. Well, how's that? I talked to the doc when I picked up the death slug. Yeah. It entered the right center of his chest about here and traveled straight. Yeah. Came to rest in his right back muscle. Line of travel's all off. No right-handed man's likely to shoot himself that way. Nope. What about the doors when you found them? Well, we'll show you the way they were when we got in. This bolt was thrown. His key was turned. His chair was propped up under these knobs like so. What about the key? Was it still in the lock? Yeah. That place looks solid enough. Plaster walls. Not much chance of anybody getting through them. You check those bookcases? Any of them moving anyway? No, they appear to be solid. Well, what do you think, Ray? Well, I don't know. The way that door was barricaded, the rest of the room. Nobody could have shot him then gotten outside. And they couldn't have come through that window, that's for sure. Well, you had to break it. Right. Well, where it's set up, you shouldn't have too much trouble finding a suspect. How's that? Find a butler built like an envelope. Hey, uh, you didn't see anything of an empty shell casing last night, did you? No, there was no reason to look for one. Sure, no sign of any now. Let's see if we can turn it. Yeah, it looks to me like the rug's been vacuumed since last night. Let's talk to the Hamlin woman. Mrs. Hamlin. Yes, something you want? Has anyone been in the study since last night? I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. You didn't say anything about it. Did you clean the room? Well, yes, I told you I was straightening up the house. Did you see an empty shell casing? I don't know what you mean. Like this, the brass part, see? No, I didn't see anything like that. Did you use the vacuum cleaner this morning? Yes, I did. Have you emptied it since you used it? No. Wonder if we could see it. I don't know what this is all about, but if you want the vacuum, I'll get it. I'll give you a hand with it. It's not heavy. Do you want the attachments, too? No, ma'am, just the vacuum itself, please. And a piece of newspaper? All right. Here it is. Thank you. I wish I knew what this is all about. There it is. What's the caliber, Ray? Nine millimeter. about that, are you? Yes. What makes you think there might be another one? How many shots did you hear last night, Miss Hamlin? One. You sure about that? Yes. Why? We have reason to believe there were two shots fired. What difference does it make how many there were? It might make a lot of difference. Why? My husband killed himself. I can't be sure how many times he might have fired the gun. Once, twice, three times. What difference does it make? I'll try to explain it to you. Your husband was holding a 38 caliber revolver when we found him, but the bullet that killed him was fired from a 9 millimeter automatic. I don't know what you're talking about. What are you trying to say? Miss Hamlin, we don't believe your husband killed himself. You're not serious. I'm afraid we are. This whole thing's ridiculous. Not according to the evidence. Well, who'd want to kill him? Who'd have a reason? That's what we're trying to find out. Would you get your mother, please? What do you want to talk to her about? Would you get her, please? She's not well. She's had enough trouble. There's no reason for you to make any more for her. Don't you worry about it, Nora. Mother, you shouldn't be up. I heard you talking. I've been listening. Haven't seen you before. Murray's my name. How do you do? Jesse Gaynor, Nora's mother. How are you? Now, what's all this about Mr. Hamlin not killing himself? Well, that's right, Mrs. Gaynor. What makes you think it is? Several things. Do you have a gun in the house? You mean a pistol? An automatic. Might. Why? Where is it? In the table drawer in the living room. We'd like to take a look at it. All right. In there. German Luger. Does that gun belong to you, Mrs. Gaynor? 
Yes, my husband had it. It's mine now. Mr. Gaynor, it's our duty to advise you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. Any statement you make may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you desire and cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed before any questioning. Yes, I understand. But what sense does it make to tell me all that legal mumbo-jumbo? All this talk about Mr. Hamlin not killing himself. If he didn't do it, who did? That's what we're trying to find out here. Uh-huh. But... You've got somebody you're looking at, haven't you? Somebody you figure did it. That gun belongs to you, doesn't it? I, huh? You're the only one who witnessed the shooting, isn't that right? That's right. Well, now, why don't you tell us about it? Because if I did, you'd never believe it. Try us. All right. Mr. Hamlin came here last night. Like I said, he was drunk. Came in and started yelling. I was sitting right here, reading. He started to curse at me, using foul language. Yeah? I didn't pay him no mind told him to go away, that, that Nora was through with him. He wouldn't go. Yes, ma'am. All of a sudden, he pulled out a gun and started waving it around. Said if I didn't get Nora, he'd kill himself. I, I thought it was just some more of his play acting. Yes, ma'am. I didn't pay any attention to him. Figured when he was through, he'd go away. I went back to reading the book. Made him madder than ever. Go on, Miss Gaynor. He grabbed the book out of my hand and shot it. Shot right at it. Then he threw it into the fireplace. He shot your book, and then he threw it into the fireplace. Now, did he shoot at you? No, no, at my book, not at me. Just all of a sudden, something happened to me. I don't think I've ever been so mad. I took the gun out of the table there and shot him. He got real scared and ran into the study, closed the door behind him. Yes, ma'am. I heard him lock the door and start moving the furniture around. Then what happened? Right after that, I heard him fall down. And then... Then Nora came into the room. Mother, why didn't you tell me? Wasn't any reason to. I had to think about it. What I'd done and what I had to do. Yes, ma'am. I was going to call you men this morning and tell you the truth. I really was. Yes, ma'am. I really was. Just all of a sudden, last night when he shot my book, I, I've never been so mad. I really wanted to kill him. You remember it all pretty well, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. All right. You want to get a coat, Mrs. Gaynor? We'll have to take you downtown. Yes, sir. I'll get my coat. Is it going to be all right? We don't decide that, ma'am. But she told the truth. Isn't that going to make a difference? We'll put it down that way. the book. There's the slug. What's left of it? The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 14th, trial was held in Department 186, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The defendant pled... Sunday night is the lonely night of the week. That's Saturday night, and it's the loneliest night. Not according to this report. Well, I'm rather comfortable. I'm sick and tired of trying to do a job and putting my head against a stone wall. I've had it, Captain. Up to here, I've had it. What's eating Maxwell, Skipper? The Halter case. Liquor store heist in Hollywood. Owner was shot. Yeah. 
The case got thrown out of court. Homer made a full statement, didn't he? Yeah, but his attorney claimed undue use of force. Force? I remember when Maxwell brought him in. Couldn't shut him up. Kept screaming he was guilty and wanted to cop out. Lawyer claims Maxwell worked him over before he brought him in. Why? Because Halter was trying to blow a hole in his belly? Maxwell would be a dead man if Halter's gun hadn't misfired. DA covered all that. Said Maxwell should have been commended for knocking him down instead of shooting him. Judge agreed. That's not why he dismissed it. Yeah? Judge felt Maxwell didn't have enough cause to bust him. We knew Halter was on the run. By the time a warrant was issued, he could have been in Mexico. Yeah, I know. Well, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Carl's tired. We all are. I'd like to give him a day or two, but I just can't spare anybody right now. Yeah, I guess we all blow a little steam once in a while. He'll be okay. I hope so. He's a good man. I'd hate to lose him. Thursday, February 14th. For the next three days, it seemed as though half the people in Los Angeles were trying to kill or maim the other half. If they weren't beating each other with blunt instruments, they were stabbing each other with sharp ones or using guns. The calls kept coming in faster than we could fill out reports. Joe, Bill, see you in a minute. Sorry, you're going to have to take over Maxwell's workload for a while. Did he come down with something? Yeah, an occupational disease. What's that? Frustration. He hasn't shown up, he hasn't called in. How long's it been, Skipper? He didn't check in for his watch. Maybe we can run out and see him. No dice, Joe. He called in sick Monday. I sent Myers and Baroni to see if he needed anything. He wasn't home. They found him in a saloon, half-bombed. Too bad. We can't allow a man carrying a badge and a gun to jump into a bottle, no matter what the reason. No, sir. He hasn't caused any trouble, has he? Not yet, but I can't gamble he won't. I talked to him, Joe. I told him I was setting him down for two days. When he came back, we'd forget about it. He told me loud and clear what I could do with my two days. I didn't hear it. But when he didn't show this morning, that's as far as I could go. Well, I had to turn it over to internal affairs. Well, it's no secret that Carl's got personal problems, Skipper. Know anybody who doesn't? Three seventeen p.m. Sergeants Frank Isbell and Taylor Searcy of Internal Affairs Division wanted to talk to us. One of IAD's main responsibilities is to check on the conduct of all officers in the department. So far, they'd been unable to locate Sergeant Carl Maxwell. When's the last time you saw him? Saturday morning, about 8.30. He say anything might indicate he was thinking of taking off? No, we didn't talk to him. He usually do a lot of drinking. I never knew him to take more than a couple. Said he didn't like the flavor of liquor. According to the bartenders we talked to, he's changed his taste in the last couple of days. Maxwell's not a lush, if that's what you think. Maybe not, but we still have to pick up that badge and gun. You know, you're making him sound like a bum. He's been on the force 12 years. He's only fired that gun twice. How many times have you been wandering around drunk with it? You sure you can't think of any place we might find him? If we knew, we'd tell you. We don't like this any better than you do. Department orders. We understand. What's going to happen to him? He's got a trial board on Monday. He'll get a fair shake. But if he doesn't show up for it... Yeah. He's bought in. We better talk to the old man. Right. Joe? Yeah? You're the one who ought to ask him why. You got the rank. Well, you want to look for Maxwell, too, don't you? Certainly. It was my idea. We'll both talk to him. I'll wait right here outside the office if you need me. Why, you just holler. Oh, I couldn't do a thing like that to you. Why not? It was your idea. Captain Joe would like to talk to you if you got a minute. Come on in the office, both of you. What makes you think you can dig him out when IAD can't? Huh? You've been talking to internal affairs, haven't you? Yes, sir. You piled up a lot of the crude days, haven't you? Yes, sir. So is every man in the division. How much you've got coming? 46 days. I asked you before, Gannon. Yes, sir. Internal affairs can't find him. What makes you think you can? Well, we'd like to give it a try. And you'd like four or five days to run it down? Yes, sir. That ought to do it. Two ought to do it. That's all I can give you right now. You know how tight things are. Two will be fine. Don't waste them. No, sir. Uh, just one more thing. Yes, sir? I want you to know I had the same idea. Sergeant William Riddle, the police department counselor. Riddle is the department chaplain as well. Carl Maxwell was an ex-serviceman, and like a lot of us, we took our troubles to the army chaplain. 
Maybe Maxwell talked some of his over with Chaplain Riddle. Sorry, Bill. Maxwell never came to me with any of his problems. You think it was the harder thing that did it to him? I'm only guessing, but I've seen these things before. I think having that case thrown out of court was the final straw. But this blow-up appears to me like it's been brewing for some time. How do you mean, Bill? You've seen it happen before. How many officers do you know about that have gone into traumatic shock after having been wounded in the line of duty? This wasn't Maxwell's problem, of course, but there's a similarity. His wound is of a deeper nature, a mental laceration, you might call it. Something like we knew in the service, call it combat fatigue. Yeah, it could be. Just as surely as some of the men who get shot on the job and fall apart due to shock, others break down due to the pressures of the job. Some of the men who are wounded never recover and have to be relieved of duty. Some who suffer what we call combat fatigue are no different. I see. Now, please understand, I'm not implying for a minute that Carl Maxwell should be or will be relieved of duty. But one thing's certain. If he's taken to the bottle, his life expectancy as a working detective in this department is relatively short. You'll have a hearing before a trial board and be dismissed. That's generally the way these things go down, isn't it? Yeah. We just had a thread to pick up, some place to begin. You figure internal affairs has covered all the obvious places? No question there. Sometimes I think those guys are better investigators than we are. <laughs> I won't comment on that. I used to work there. I'm prejudiced in their favor. But let me give you a thought. Anything's more than we got now. Maybe you're too close to it. How do you mean, Bill? You're looking for a friend, not a suspect. Try approaching it the same way you would any other case, even if internal affairs has been there. Yeah. Start at the beginning. Four fifty-five p.m. We decided to take Bill Riddle's advice. We would start from scratch. Since we were on off-duty time, we checked my car out of the police personnel parking area. Los Angeles is a big place to lose yourself in. Undoubtedly, that's what Carl Maxwell had in mind. We knew Maxwell lived in an apartment building. We drove over and talked with his landlady. She told us the same story she had told Internal Affairs Division. She hadn't seen Maxwell in three days, and she had no idea where he might have gone. 1 a.m. For the next eight hours, Bill and I covered every bar, restaurant, and bowling alley within a 10-mile radius of where Maxwell lived. We batted zero. Nobody had seen or heard from him for at least three days. 2.18 a.m. Before we called it a night, we decided to stop and see Champ Ridgely. Ridgely is an ex-light heavy we used to follow when he fought at the Olympic Auditorium. Maxwell and he used to box in the Golden Gloves before Ridgely turned pro. They were good friends. Hi, Sarge. Hi, Cannon. Champ. How's it going, Champ? Ain't seen you fellas for a while. How about some donuts and coffee? No, no donuts. Too fattening. Just coffee, Champ. Anything you say, Cannon. Sugar and cream? No, no thanks. No, sir. Never use it. Too fattening. Cannon, I got a new kind since I saw you last. Chocolate arms with marshmallow, toasted almonds, and peanuts on top. Well, I guess I'll try one after all. Give it a little shot of whipped cream, too, if you like, Bill. No. no. Well, all right. Sure you like it, Gannon. Been selling like hotcakes. Business been good, huh, champ? Can't complain. It ain't like when I was going ten frames every Friday night, but I ain't bleeding as much, neither. Tell me, you see Carl Maxwell lately? Not for a week or so. Something bugging him, Sarge? What well, makes you say that? Well, it's like he's been, you know, kind of down. He ain't in any trouble, is he? No, no trouble. I hope not. He's a good guy. How's your girlfriend? What's her name, Flora? Oh, that time. Picked her up again. What was it this time? Shoplifting? I told her a thousand times. I said, Flora, you gotta stop. Now, how does it look to the neighbors? Cops come around all the time looking for the hot stuff. They don't even go to the hawk shops anymore. They come here first. Who picked her up this time, Morelli? Yeah. He spends more time with her than he does with his wife. You know what he found out of this time, Bill? You know what? A pair of water skis. When did she learn to ski? What ski? She don't even know what they're for. When she brought home a lawnmower. Well, what was she going to do with a lawnmower? I didn't ask. I was afraid she might steal a lawn. You finished? Yeah. That was great, champ. You'll sell a lot of those. You ought to try one, Joe. Nice and light. No, thanks. Real taste sensation. I'm sure. We gotta be going, champ. Yeah, I'll see you, champ. Thanks. Sarge, do me a favor, will you? I'll try. Stop in and say hello to Flora. It'll cheer her up. I sure will. Next time I'm by the county jail. Thanks a lot, Sarge. 
if she hasn't stolen it. Friday, February the 15th, 7.30 a.m. I picked Bill up early the next morning and we headed for the Ventura Freeway. Like a great many officers, Carl Maxwell came from a police family. We drove over to see his brother, Al, a sergeant working uniform out of Van Nuys Division. He lived in Reseda. We knew internal affairs would have already checked with Al, but we figured it wouldn't do any harm to talk to him again. Well, what brings you two out here so early in the morning? We'd like to talk to you, Al. Good morning, Sergeant Freddy, Mr. Gannon. Hi, right, boys. Okay, gang, time for school. Hey, don't forget your lunches. Oh, yeah. Nice kids. Mary and I may keep them. You change your mind, Eileen. I'll be glad to take them off your hands. You just try telling that to Mary. Yeah. You call me, Sergeant? Good morning, Joe. Bill? Good morning, Mary. You just a time for breakfast? No, thanks, Mary. We've already eaten. Well, sit down, please. Thank you. Al, we were hoping you'd have some idea where Carl might have gone. I told IAD everything I know, Joe. Didn't help him much. How about you, Mary? I wasn't home when they came by, but I'm afraid I can't help much either. Carl's in a lot of trouble, isn't he? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Unless he appears for that trial board, he could be dismissed. Poor Carl. You working this on your own time? Sort of. Nice of you guys. We've worked with Carl a lot of years, Al. You know him better than anybody, Al. What suddenly got to him? Oh, I don't think it was sudden, Bill. I've been worried about him quite a while. How's that? Oh, he hasn't been the same guy. Didn't laugh as much. Wouldn't talk. Couldn't seem to think of anything but his job. I can't remember when he took his last day off. You ever try to get him to see the department counselor? Yeah, but he brushed it off, said he was in great shape, that I was imagining things. How long has this been going on? Ever since Ellen died. For two years now, Carl's been walking around as though part of him is missing. That's why he works so hard. To fill up that empty space his wife left. So he won't have time to think. Yeah. He's put all his emotions into the job. That's why things hit him so hard. If he gets kicked off the department, he'll really have nothing left. Yeah, I guess. You sure he didn't say anything about where he was going? Nothing, Bill. No, I've been racking my brain. Wait a minute. I don't know if it means anything. Go on, Mary. When he was here last week, you were on night watch, Al. He talked about the happiest time of his life. Said he supposed he ought to be grateful for at least that much happiness. Yeah. On his honeymoon. He say where? Someplace up near Big Bear, wasn't it, Mary? A Swiss place. No, a place that looked Swiss. Kind of a chalet-type hotel. Worth a try. Wish I could go with you, but I've got night watch the rest of the month. I think we can handle it, Al. If we can find him, that is. Are you policeman? That's right, son. It's Carl's son, Matt. He's been staying with us since Ellen passed away. My daddy's a policeman. I know. We're friends of his. He's not here. He went away. Well, we're going to find him for you. I better come with you. I'm afraid not. Not this time, Matt. What if you can't find him yourself? never clean and simple, is it? No. There's always an innocent bystander. No, thanks. I 
a drink, Friday? Not now, Carl. Oh, on duty and all that jazz, huh? Come on, Carl. It's been a long drive. Talk to us. Yeah, well, that's a long story. Let's just say I've had it. That wasn't worth the trip. It's the best I can do. No, it isn't, Carl. We want to know why. Why you're throwing 12 years of good police work right out the window. Where do you want me to start, Joe? It takes quite a while to cover 12 years. We've got the time. 12 long years, tried and true. Yeah, well, they're a total waste. How's that for openers? You don't really mean that, Carl. Don't I? You tell me who cares about all that good police work. We do. Mary cares. Your brother, Al. And Matt. Sure, let's talk about Matt. You know how much money I could have made in any other job in 12 years? Enough to send him to a good school by the time he was ready. Maybe set him up in business. Or don't I owe him anything? A lot more than you're giving him doing this. He's your son. You owe him a father. A sober one. Neither of you understand what I'm talking about, do you? Oh, yeah. I read you real good. But all I can hear is a loud cry of self-pity. Is it self-pity breaking your back trying to do a job that nobody seems to want you to do? You had a case thrown out of court. You've had it happen before. We all have. Doesn't seem to be enough to be a cop anymore. You gotta be a Philadelphia lawyer, a diplomat, a, a psychologist, an expert on social behavior. That's part of the job, Carl. Always has been. You tell me about it, Cannon. When I first signed on for this job, I was given to understand that my primary function was to enforce the laws. Not make them. Not question them. But to enforce them. Sure, I know a certain amount of diplomacy is required, along with tolerance and understanding. The old hat squads are gone, along with the hot lights in the back room, the, the blue-jacketed bullies who used to slug a confession out of a man or a thing of the past. Look, when police work became a profession instead of a male fist, I knew I wanted to be part of it. I believe in equality and fair play, the right to dissent in an open society, the right of privacy, all the inalienable rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Well, it seems to me the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Nobody ever told you that badge was a ticket to paradise. No, Joe, nobody ever told me that. But they did tell me that people make the laws we don't. And that they pay us to enforce them. Well, it seems like somehow nobody really wants you to do the job too good. Look, you pick up a suspect. If you don't treat him like a VIP, he'll be out on the street screaming police brutality. He can confess to rape, murder, child molesting, arson or assault. But unless you've given him a five-minute speech that tells him not to talk to you, you're the one who's in trouble. You take away a policeman's right to interrogate. You cut off his hands. A while back, the President of the United States came to the city. He couldn't even walk in the front door of a hotel to make a speech. He had to use the rear entrance because 10,000 people were guilty of poor deportment. They refused to share with him the self-same constitutional rights they were claiming for themselves, the right of free access. To come and go as you please. The right of free speech. And those are the same people who pay our salaries. The same people who cry foul when we try and enforce their laws. Look, there are 5,200 of us in the city of 3 million. We're a minority group, too. You tell me, Joe. Is it worth it? Depends on what you want, Carl. If you're looking for applause, no, you should have been an actor. If it's money you're after, truck drivers make more. If you expect 100% gratitude for doing a job that's got to be done, then somebody goofed 12 years ago when they let you get by. You're right, Carl. We are a minority group, but not by an act of God or an accident. The only way you become a member of this minority group is by asking for it. And only about 4% make it, you know that. Maybe you've forgotten what you went through to join. The physical endurance tests, the psychological evaluations... Are you suited to be a police officer? Can you be objective? Will your emotions affect your job? Can you take orders? Can you give them? Does carrying a gun and a badge give you a feeling of power? Now, if you don't measure up properly to all those qualifications, you don't get into this minority, Carl. Only the best men do. The cream. And what about those three solid months hitting the books going to school? Have you forgotten your probationary period? Where you really started learning to become a policeman? Nine long months to make sure you did learn, because if you didn't, you could still be eliminated. And after all that, if you were still in the handful that lasted, then, Carl, you could say I'm a cop. You earned your way into this minority group, and now you're frustrated. Well, pal, join the club. Gripe about it, that's your privilege. But while you're sitting there on your bottom sucking on a drink, try to remember why you signed on in the first place. It's a fine profession. Four professionals. 
and there aren't enough to go around. When does the trial board convene? Monday morning. What do you think, Joe? Will they bounce me out? Maybe not. If you can convince them. Of what? That you deserve to be a policeman, and you still want to be one. And if I can't, you don't belong on the job. Police Department heard the case of Sergeant Carl Maxwell. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The board found Sergeant Carl Maxwell guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and of having been absent from his post. This is all the new rage, you know, Joe. Yeah, what's that? Motorcycles. Oh, is that so? Figured I'd get the boy one for Christmas, but I gotta decide which one. Well, which one does he want? Well, he's kinda hung up on this Burrito 25, but I don't know if it's the right one for him. Why is that? Well, it's three horsepower, Joe. Not fast enough, huh? Oh, it's fast enough, all right. Pulls a pretty good hill, too, providing you have the right sprocket. Well, what's the problem, then? Too much money? No, I wouldn't say that. The price is right. Well, price is right, it's fast enough, it climbs okay. Now, what else is there? Joe, you don't understand. This three horsepower model only has one seat. No, I guess I don't understand. Well, the boy's got to learn how to drive it. Where am I going to sit? Now I understand. I knew you would. Robbery homicide, Friday. Where is that? Okay, got it. Rooming house, 127 grand. Year? Yeah, multiple homicide just went down. How many victims? Three and no suspects. <laughs> Five ten p.m. We arrived at the Grandee Rooming House. The first officers on the scene were Jim Smith and Bob Arnold. The success or failure of a homicide investigation can be directly related to the care used in preserving the crime scene. Smith and Arnold had performed their task well. We got the call at sixteen thirty hours. What was the call? Unknown trouble. We came in the front door. It was sixteen forty five hours. These people were standing out in the hallways. They all heard the shots. I asked them to come down and wait until you got here. They didn't observe anything except those two bodies lying over there on the floor by the TV set. Those people over at the table, you got their names? Right here. Where's the ambulance crew? Upstairs with Sergeant Doherty. A wounded man was found in the second floor hall. They're up getting him now. Name's Mort Baker, the apartment house manager. What about the building exterior? Sealed tight. Since we got here, nobody's been in or out. That's good. Sergeant Doherty roped off the area. Thought it would help protect the scene. How many have crossed into the scene and upstairs since you arrived? Five. My partner and I, when we first got here, we looked over the three floors and sealed them off. Since that time, only Sergeant Doherty and the two ambulance attendants have been through. We instructed them on how to walk through the scene. Nothing's been touched or disturbed as far as I know. All right, fine. Joe, Bill, you have this one? Yeah, is this the manager? Right, he's been shot twice in the abdomen as far as I can see. Wait, wait. Off one. Off one. What's that? Off one. You better get him rolling. You got somebody that can ride in with him? Already been arranged. I've got a man waiting at the ambulance. He's been briefed. Did he do much talking while you were waiting for the ambulance? He was just barely conscious. He kept mumbling something, but I couldn't understand. What did it sound like to you? Oft one is the way I made it. Could be. I just couldn't tell for sure. Oft one? Yeah, two words. O-F-T-O-N-E. Can't make much sense out of that, can you? No, but one thing sure, isn't it? What's that? It must have made sense to him. 
5.25 p.m., departmental orders provide that the senior or ranking investigator is to be in complete charge of a crime scene upon his arrival. In addition to notifying latent prints, photos, and laboratory personnel, three additional detective teams were requested to assist in the investigation. Sergeant Doherty was asked to organize an exterior search. Bill and I began preliminary examination of the crime scene. The front doors leading to the lobby were closed but unlocked upon entry. Windows closed and latched, blinds halfway down. Okay, the procedure for the search will be the lobby here. Staircase to the first floor, then on up to the third. We'll use a cross projection diagram. Photos next, then we'll have prints in. Now after we make the first walk through, we can check and see if we can use one of the rooms to coordinate from. Right. All right. Victim number one. Small piece of red cloth in his right hand. There's a button on it. No signs of evidence around victim number two. Television tube broken. Particles of glass on the floor. What is that, a slug hole in the middle of the tube? That's what it is. The set's still plugged in. Apparent exit hole in the rear of the TV. And the entrance hole here in the wall. Looks like the height matches. Traces of plaster directly beneath the hole on the floor. Okay, got it. Switch is in the on position. Uh -huh. An expended shell casing. Nine millimeter. Looks like our suspect's holding an automatic. There might be more of these lying around, so let's be careful where we walk. If we find any more, we'll plot their location and include their positions on the diagram. Right. What do you make of those? Blood stains, palm prints. Looks like somebody took a walk, doesn't it? Yeah, from the angle of the prints, I'd say whoever left them was on the way up. I agree. The next question is up to where? Up to right here. They quit. Six ten p.m. We completed our preliminary examination of the multi-floor crime scene and gave initial directions to the police photographers. We established an investigation command post in the manager's apartment. The captain had assigned six additional detectives to assist in the investigation. We briefed and deployed each team. So the overall evidence is sketchy. There's a strong possibility the suspect's wearing a torn red shirt with a missing button. Evidence so far indicates the murder weapon is a nine millimeter. You ID'd the victims yet? Yeah, one of the tenants did. Now, supposedly all three of them live in the building. One of them was the manager. Their rooms have all been checked out in addition to the other 15 rooms in the building. All right, any other questions? Okay, we'll coordinate everything from here. Now, you all have this telephone number. Somebody will be manning it at all times. If you find anything, check in. That's it. Captain? Egby? Thanks for sending the manpower, Captain. We sure need them. Forget the thanks. Let's just get results. Now, what do you got since you called me? No change. Three victims, two dead, one wounded. We've got a few bits of physical evidence, but nothing really significant so far. Witnesses? Nothing so far. The teams are out checking the neighborhood now. What about the weapon? All gunshot wounds, Captain. I think I told you that on the phone. We haven't come up with a weapon yet, but it looks like it's going to be a 9 millimeter. What makes you think so? Casings? Yes, sir. All right, what else? As far as the facts go, that's it. Okay, so you've got no motive. What's the seat of your pants say? What is it? Some hype walks in here, juice to the gills, blows three people up? Argument? Robbery? Family dispute? What? It's like we said, Skipper. So far, there's just not much to go on. Well, let's get something. That's what we're getting paid for, right? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Rotten migraine. I didn't mean to lean on you. It's just that my head's about to break. How about some aspirin? I left them in my desk. You got any on you, Bill? Sure have, right here. Oh, must have run out. Bill Gannon walking to the drugstore out of aspirin. Can you beat that? It's unheard of. Sorry, but you know, maybe you got a cold coming on, like me. That could give you a headache. Huh? What about some vitamin C? Best thing in the world for colds. Go ahead, take a couple. Yeah, well, thanks anyway, Bill. I think I'll get by. What's the latest on the wounded victim at the hospital? What's his name, Mort Baker? Yes, sir, it's been 30 minutes since we've heard anything. The last report had him listed as extremely critical. Anyone been able to talk with him yet? No, sir, he's been unconscious from the time he was taken from here. You have any ideas on that mumble jumbo he muttered? What was that, off one? Yes, sir, we've gone over it a dozen times. I can't make anything out of it. 
Oft won. You sure that's what he said? Well, it was slurred, and he barely got it out, but the best I could tell, that's what it was. I think it could be a room number, maybe? We thought of that, too, Captain. There's a room number one on each of the three floors. The numbers are preceded by a letter. First floor is A, second B, third C, A1, B1, C1. They've all been checked out. When do you think we can talk to that wounded manager? It's Friday. Yeah. Okay. There's your answer. The manager just died. Off to one. His last words nobody could understand. Yeah, we better try to make some sense out of it. It's the only lead we got. Maybe he meant off something. How's that? You know, off room one, off something. What do you think? No, sir, I definitely say it was OFT, like a word ending. Oft. 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 Start at the beginning. What do you mean? A-O-F-T, B-O-F-T. You keep going. 24 left. Anything's worth a try. C-O-F-T, D-O-F-T. You sure can arrive at some oddball words this way. Wait a minute. Here's one that's maybe not so oddball. That makes sense to you? L-O-F-T. Loft, sure. A lot of these old apartment buildings have loft rooms. Usually out of the way, hard to find. It's worth a try. Go ahead, I'll cover the phone. Say, how about a vitamin B? Maybe you're just worn out and tired. I wasn't till this thing went down. 6.20 p.m. We proceeded to the third floor to follow up on our hunch. Nah, it looks like it wasn't such a good idea. I don't see anything that would indicate a loft room. Wait a minute. What about that? We'll need something to stand on. Yeah. This looks like it might be the door key. Somebody either hid it there or it got kicked under the rug. is spring loaded it closes automatically borrow your flashlight please p.m. A preliminary examination of the loft room was conducted. The police photographers were directed to photograph the scene prior to an additional search and more thorough examination. We returned to brief the captain. Had his robe on, lying in bed, door locked from the inside, and he's dead from a gunshot wound. Yes, sir, that's it. No evidence of a struggle, no casings around. Could be he wasn't shot inside the room. It's possible. It's not too logical he'd be running around in his bathrobe, though, is it? Uh, I don't know. At this point, I'd say anything was possible. It usually is. What do you have in mind now? Well, the photogs are covering the scene. As soon as they're through, I'll send latent prints up. Then we'll go through the room with a fine-tooth comb. Sergeant Friday, we've got the press outside. OK, bring them around the rear entrance and then up here, will you? All right. Oh, and Arnold. Yes, sir? You've done a real good job protecting the scene so far. Keep at it. Let's don't lose anything now. Right, Sarge. You want to handle the interview, Skipper? It's your investigation, Joe. Yes, sir. Well, like you told Arnold, don't lose anything. Did you take one of these vitamin Bs? Yeah. But you feel a whole lot different now, don't you? Uh-huh. Worse. 6.45 p.m. Representatives of the news media had been waiting for 45 minutes. A few were faced with last-minute deadlines. They were anxious for information. Okay, gentlemen, now, if we can settle down here, I'll give you what I can. 
Right now, I can't give you too much. About 4.30 this afternoon, there was a shooting incident in this rooming house, which has resulted in the death of four persons, all male. Uh, Sergeant Friday Wood, City Press. What kind of evidence have you come up with so far? Only physical evidence. We have no eyewitnesses, so far at least. They're still looking. We have three teams knocking on doors and 15 uniformed officers checking the neighborhood. What kind of physical evidence, Sergeant? Well, right now, we can't measure the value of the evidence, and until we can, that information has to remain confidential. Do you have a suspect in custody? No, Phil, no suspects. What are you working on now, Joe? We're still going through the scene for evidence and reconstruction of the crime. You know the cause of death on each victim? Yes, sir. It appears that each died from gunshot wounds. You know what kind of a gun? Yes, sir. I believe we've narrowed that down. Oh, was there more than one weapon involved? Preliminary findings indicate a strong possibility there was only one gun used. What kind was it? Do you know? Yes, sir, we do, but I'm not at liberty to reveal that right now. Why not? It might damage the case, Mr. Woods. Joe, I remember Narco making a big raid in this building about two months ago. You figure these killings might be related? Well, it's a possibility, Jerry, but so far there's nothing that would indicate narcotic activity. I understand you found the bodies in different locations all over the building. What's that mean to you, Joe? It's not significant yet, Phil. Once we reconstruct the crime, it might give us some. What about a psycho angle? Seems to me nobody but a nut would do something like this. Well, that's possible, too. We're making background checks on everyone that's even casually involved here. Well, I'll give you five to one. You've got a gangland-style caper going here, Joe, and a big supply of narcotics is behind the whole thing. The suspect knocked off a dealer. The others were either his friends or eyewitnesses that could identify the killer. Jerry, you're as sharp as a marble. Okay, just a hunch, Joe. I'd call it 10 pounds of air. Maybe you and Friday ought to switch jobs. Not a bad idea. Maybe at least we'd get a better story. What about pictures, Joe? Can we grab a few? No pictures. Sorry, Jerry. Maybe later. I've already got one. Of what, Phil? I took it from the hallway on the way in. Beautiful shot at the two bodies in the lobby. Phil, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Sure, Joe. What is it? Don't use that picture. Why not, Joe? We need it for the racing final. I know, but any picture released to the public now could blow the case for us. There might be something in it that would prevent us from apprehending the suspect or cause us to lose a major key on the polygraph. That important, huh? That important, Phil. Now, what do you say? I say I don't use it until you give the okay. Thanks, pal. Your word's good enough. Is there anything else you can tell us, Joe? I got a deadline. That's about it, Jerry. It's just too early in the investigation to give you any more right now. Can we expect more later? You know we'll give you what we can. Good enough. Thanks, Joe. Not for very much, but thanks. It's not good enough for me, Sergeant. You know, I would have used that picture if my photo got it. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Woods, but I hope you can understand our position here. I'm sorry, too, but this is my first assignment in Los Angeles, and I want to turn in a good story. Your story will carry just as much as anyone else's will. I worked newspapers all over the Midwest before I came out here. There wasn't anything covered up by the police. They gave us everything we wanted. I'll make book they didn't, Mr. Woods, and the term isn't cover-up. We're not hiding anything here. It's a matter of conducting a responsible investigation. Responsible? Maybe, but at whose expense? You know as well as I do, the public has a right to be informed, and it's my job to do that. I could dream up more than you're giving. Mr. Woods, you and I both have an obligation to the public, now don't we? Yours is informing, mine is protecting. If we work together, we can perform a better service to the public, can't we? I can't do my job if the investigation is frustrated by publishing information that might provide the suspect an opportunity to escape prosecution or worse, be acquitted. That's your bag, Sergeant. Who are you to judge? You know the Bill of Rights establishes freedom of the press? Yes, sir, that's right. But there's somewhat of a conflict in the Bill of Rights that we both have to live with, don't we? And recently the Supreme Court has said so, whether we like it or not. How do you figure? The First Amendment is what you're referring to, right? Read the Sixth. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy a right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. Now, this case, with four dead people, will most likely gain nationwide attention. I'm sure it's already on the wires. Now, if the wrong information or incriminating evidence leading to the suspect is published, it's going to be impossible to get that impartial jury. The press has done a lot for us on other investigations. They put out information that helped us apprehend the suspect. A case like this will undoubtedly bring a dozen or so phony confessors. The evidence we withhold can mean the difference many times in not prosecuting the wrong man and in prosecuting the right one. I understand what you're saying, Sergeant, but how does that help me? I'm not getting the story I was sent out to get. Oh, I think you are, Mr. Woods, as much at least as anyone else is. And there's also a measure of satisfaction if you look at it a different way. How's that? The contribution we make by working together in the public interest. Yeah. It's really why we're both here, isn't it? I guess sometimes we lose sight of the future in our eagerness to grab a piece of the present, huh? Well, if we didn't once in a while, we wouldn't be human, would we? I think I just got a story, Sergeant. Thanks. I'm going on back to the office. Give me a yell if anything pops. Yes, sir. Did you ever think of transferring to public affairs? Where'd you learn all that stuff? From public affairs. Seven ten p.m. The investigation continued. Crime lab personnel had finished the scientific inspection. Bill and I coordinated and accepted the gathering of physical evidence. 
7.25 p.m., the course of the investigation changed abruptly. At 7.10 p.m., investigators located a witness in the apartment building directly across the street who had observed a male Mexican wearing a white T-shirt run from the Grandee rooming house at the approximate time of the crime. His name's Pedro Martinez. Pretty frightened. We found him hiding in the garage across the street. Did you find a gun? No gun. He admits he was involved in the shooting of one guy here in the rooming house, but says it was self-defense. Well, how's that? Well, his story is he was coming down the steps from his girlfriend's room on the second floor. He saw this guy with a gun running around shooting. Martini says the guy put one shot into the TV set and then turned around and shot two men in the lobby. Martini's was scared and tried to run out of the building. The suspect stood in front of him and aimed right at his head. Martini says he grabbed the suspect's wrist, fought with him, the gun went off, and the suspect had a hole in his chest. Martini says that's how he got the blood on his T-shirt. What did he say happened then? He said the guy went down on his knees, that's the last he saw of him. Martini's ran out of the building and hid in the garage until we found him. How'd he describe the suspect? Male Caucasian, about 40, sandy-haired, 6 foot, 200 pounds. What about clothes? Only thing he could remember was a red shirt. The description matches our victim up in the loft room, except for that shirt. Yeah, SID threw that room up there. Should be. Let's shake it down. Seven thirty p.m. The photographers and latent print personnel had completed their work in the loft room. Carl Freeman, one of the print men, was packing up. Joe, Bill, you all through? Yeah, I found something. So did I. Red shirt. It's a bullet hole. Button missing from the sleeve. We can check for match against the piece we found in the hand of the victim by the TV set. Could you use a German Luger? We got work it in. Top drawer, right over there. Recently fired. I was just thinking, those guys from the press. What about them? They wanted a story. I guess maybe now we got one for them. <laughs> Seven forty-five p.m. Bill called the captain to fill him in. He also called communications to find out who had placed the original unknown trouble call. We spent the next couple of hours comparing the scientific findings and physical evidence to the stories provided by Pedro Martinez, his girlfriend, and other casual witnesses. Nine forty-five p.m. The evidence, along with autopsy reports from the coroner's office, left a definite conclusion. We called a press conference. Don't tell us you're really going to give us a story, Joe. I'm afraid you might think so, Jerry, after you've heard it. Do you have a suspect? We do. Who is it? His name is Paul Andrews, deceased. Deceased? At 4.30 p.m. this afternoon, Paul Andrews called the complaint board at PAB about the residents in this building not tuning in the TV programs that he liked to watch. We have his voice on the tape downtown, but at that time, it didn't concern the detective division. You mean you monitored the call? The complaint board downtown monitors all calls, Mr. Woods. We found his by checking back on a possible motive. It's routine procedure. Who did he shoot first? Not who, Jerry. What? He put one hole through the TV tube down in the lobby. Then what? Andrews then shot two male tenants who happened to be down in the lobby watching television. He started upstairs for his room. On the way, he ran into a young man named Pedro Martinez, who was coming down from his girlfriend's apartment. The two men struggled at the foot of the stairs. The gun went off, fatally wounding Andrews. Then, with a 9 millimeter slug in his chest, Andrews proceeded to the second floor, shot the manager, climbed another flight of stairs, and up a loft stairway to his room. Now, gentlemen, I cannot give you the exact order in which the suspect did the following, but this is what he did. He locked the door. He removed whatever he was wearing, including a red shirt, which he stuck up on a shelf in his closet. He put on his bathrobe. He hid the Luger in a dresser drawer. Then he laid down on his bed and he died. The guy was obviously a psycho. Probably never had a straight thought in his life. Sergeant, man here needs some help. I'm looking for the manager. Like to know what room Paul Andrews is in? Yes, sir. Can I help you? Got a package for him. TV set. He ordered it yesterday. have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 3rd, a coroner's hearing was held in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The coroner's jury ruled the death of Paul Andrews was a result of self-defense.
officer by the name of Phil Waverly. Works a radio unit out of Central. Yes, sir. He's being brought up before a board of rights. Is that so? You know anything about trial board procedure? No, sir, not very much. You better bone up. Why is that? He wants you to defend him. Boy, look at these reports, Joe. They're piling up pretty good. Yeah, well, I'm afraid I'm not gonna be much help. How come? I've been asked to defend somebody at a trial board. Who's in trouble? Some uniform guy in the name of Phil Waverly. Waverly? No, I don't think I know him. Neither do I. Well, he's got the right to pick anybody he wants. It's kind of a compliment, isn't it? I can live without it. I got no eyes to play lawyer. Somebody's got to defend him. Why pick me? Why not? I'd make a lousy lawyer. I'm prejudiced. If the guy's guilty, I'll help him throw the book at him. Maybe that's why he picked you. Huh? He knows if he's clean, he'll work just as hard to save his hide. 11.29 a.m. I called Internal Affairs and made an appointment with Lieutenant Roger Mayers, the department advocate. He would be representing the case against Officer Philip Waverly. Three charges against him, Joe. Improper association with a known bookmaker, accepting a bribe, and failure to identify himself as a police officer when stopped by officers conducting an official investigation. What do you got on him? I bore witnesses who saw them together a couple of times, who saw the money being passed, and a statement from the guy who bribed him. Give me a rundown, will you, Lieutenant? Vice had the bookie, name's Clover, staked out for nearly two weeks. During that time, he and Waverly were seen having dinner together twice. Vice boys didn't know who Waverly was at the time. When they busted Clover, they questioned Waverly. He gave his name, but never mentioned he was a police officer. How'd you make him? By accident. It was the first good look the arresting officers got of him. They thought he looked familiar, ran his name through personnel files, and found out he was a cop. That made it our business. The Vice boys actually saw Waverly take that money, did they? Yeah. The clincher is the bookie, Clover. He spilled it, said he was lending Waverly some money. Here's all the paperwork on him. You're pretty sure he's guilty. We wouldn't be asking for a board if we weren't. Yeah. I'm not the DA, Joe. I'm just a cop like you. There's only one thing I'd like. What's that? You prove I'm wrong. Three thirty-three p.m., Tuesday, August 29th. Pending the hearing, Officer Waverly had been temporarily relieved of duty. I got his home address and drove over to talk to him. Waverly lived in a new apartment development in the Los Feliz district. The place appeared neat and clean, but it could have used furniture. I'm buying the furniture on time. Guess the place doesn't look like much yet. How long have you lived here? Since I made the job, a little over a year. What, are you sending money home? How do you mean? Well, you earn enough to have the place pretty well furnished by now, don't you? Oh, well, I want to buy good stuff. And I had some bills I thought I'd better pay off. Uh-huh. You're just like all the rest of them, aren't you? What do you mean by that, Waverly? Well, you hardly walk in the door and say hello, and you're fish-eyeing me like you don't believe me. Well, now, you're a little oversensitive, aren't you? All right, if we sit down and get started? You already have. I'll let that pass, Waverly. You know what really gripes me? Suppose you tell me. I got a near-perfect record, and the department takes the word of a two-bit bookie over mine. All right, sit down, Waverly, and let's talk. Now, let's you and me get one thing entirely straight, Friday. I am not guilty. Not one of those charges is true. I should have played it smart and got me an attorney right off. If it wasn't for department procedure, that's exactly what I'd have done. Is that clear? Now, let me straighten you out on a few things, Waverly. I never laid eyes on you before I walked in that door. You weren't even a badge number to me, and you're not much more now. You were told by IAD you could have legal representation right off if you wanted it, but instead you picked up a copy of the department roster, ran your finger down as far as the Fs, and you quit. I didn't ask for this mess, and I'd just as soon drop it right now. You had 5,000 other men you could have picked, but for some reason, known only to you, you latched onto me. I'm here to try to get to the bottom of this thing, and we're going to do it my way, you understand? If you're telling the truth, I'll sweat it all away with you and try and get you cleared. But if you think you're going to do any table pounding to convince me you're leveling, you're dead wrong. Now, you just settle back in that chair and give it to me straight, right from the beginning. Not one of those charges is true, I'm telling you. No? Well, when you were picked up with this bookie, Clover, why didn't you identify yourself as a police officer? Well, I guess I was afraid of what would happen if they found out I was with a bookmaker. I thought you said you didn't know he was a bookie. Well, I didn't, not till ten minutes before. How about the money he's supposed to have given you? That's not true. I never took a bribe. All right. From the beginning. About three weeks ago, I was working in Elkar, and I spotted Ted in the street. We were in the same outfit in Vietnam. Matter of fact, we were pretty close. Yeah? Well, I hadn't seen him since we got out. There wasn't much time to talk, so I invited him over to my place for a drink the next day, and he came. Go on. It was kind of like old home week. We talked about the outfit, guys we knew, that type of thing. You asked him what he was doing? Sure, but he sloughed it off. Said he wasn't doing anything right now, but he wasn't hurting. Had a little money saved up. Go ahead. That's about it. He had a date, we had one drink, swapped phone numbers, and I figured that was the end of it. Yeah? Well, three or four days later, he called and said, let's have dinner. And you did? No reason not to. We got to talking, and he asked me how much money I made as a cop. When I told him, he laughed. Said he always thought I was smarter than that. Did you pick up on it? I thought he was kidding, so I went along with it. Said any time he figured out a way I could make money without working, to let me know. What'd he say to that? He said he just might do that. 
Go ahead. Well, he called me about a week later, and we had dinner again. And that was the last time you saw him? Yeah, that was when he made his pitch, the bribe. How'd he go about it? First, he talked about how close we used to be. Then he reminded me of what I said about making money without working. Said if I really meant it, I could do him a big favor and make a good-sized bundle for myself at the same time. Yeah. I asked him how. He told me he was making book, that he'd already been busted once. He said lately he thought the Vice boys had been keeping an eye on him. Well, what do you think you could do for him? He said he was sure I must know somebody working Vice. If I could keep the heat off him, I could make some pretty good loot. You go along with the idea? Look, I told you I never took a bribe. I know what you told me. What did you tell Clover? I told him I couldn't help him, that even if I could, I wouldn't. What'd he say to that? He got mad. But he gets mad in a funny way. No blow-up, no yelling. He just looked at me for a minute, then called the waiter, paid the check, and took off. What happened then? Maybe I shouldn't have, but I ran after him. I wanted him to know why I said it. I mean, he was right. We were good friends once. But he wouldn't listen to me. That's the whole story. All right. Sergeant? Yeah. I know I'm edgy, and maybe I was a little salty when you first walked in. But this thing's ripping my guts out. I'm being hung out to dry, and by a guy I once trusted as a friend. But I want to tell you something, Sergeant. What's that? I didn't just pick you to defend me by accident. I want you to know it wasn't like you said. Yeah. The guys in the field say you got a reputation. They say you're one guy who'll always back a guy to the limit if he's right. Maybe. They say you're one of the best. I don't know about that, but one thing's sure, isn't it? What's that? You got yourself a king-size mess here, boy. Yeah, I know that for sure. You don't need me, pal. You need Clarence Darrow. Wednesday, August 30th. I called Lieutenant Mayers and told him that Officer Phil Waverly and I were ready to pick a board. 10.47 a.m. Joe Waverly, this is Miss Larson. All right, let's get on with it. Have you ever been through this before? No, sir, I haven't. All right, here's how it works. We have a complete roster here of all officers from captains up. Everybody's here except the chief. City charter exempts him from serving as a board member. Now, I've removed all the tags of anyone who will be on vacation during the hearing. The rest are available to serve. Now, first, we'll pull all the tags off and put them in this box. You'll pick six names out of the box. From those six, you'll select any three. Those three will sit as board members. Got it? Yes, sir. I think so. Uh, Miss Larson will give you a copy of the names. And you and Friday can talk it over and let me know who you pick. Yes, sir. You know most of the brass sergeant. I don't know any of them. Don't let it worry you. What do you mean? By the time this is over, you'll get to know them. <laughs> Thursday, August 31st, I asked Captain Howe if I could use Bill Gannon to help in the investigation concerning Phil Waverly. He agreed to assign him to the case until the hearing was over. 9.17 a.m., we drove to Waverly's apartment. We wound up with two damaging pieces of evidence we couldn't get around. Clover's statement that he'd bribed Phil, and the eyewitness evidence of the two vice officers who saw the money being passed. I'll say it again, I never took a bribe, and that's the truth. Why would the vice boys lie? I don't know, but I'm telling the truth. One thing's sure. What's that? Somebody's lying. Friday, September 1st, we were notified that Chief of Police Tom Redden had set Waverly's hearing for September the 8th. It didn't leave much time. We decided to talk to the bookie, Ted Clover. 1.10 p.m. Clover lived in one of the new high-rise apartment buildings going up in West Hollywood. At the rentals they were getting, it looked like he was running a profitable book. Yeah? Ted Clover. Yeah. Police officers, this is Bill Gannon. My name is Friday. We'd like to talk to you. What about? Phil Waverly. You got a warrant? All we want is conversation. Come on in. You guys like bullfights? I never bothered to rate them. That's because you don't know anything about them. Now, take that Hemingway cat. He knew what it was all about. Most Americans think of Veronica as the name of an actress. That's so. Yeah, I'm an aficionado. Anything you want to know about bullfights, I got the answer. I'm sure, but that isn't what we came to talk about. You know what this is? No, of course you don't. It's a bull's ear. Ortega himself gave this to me. One of the greatest matadors in the business. Maybe the greatest. Let's talk about Phil Waverly. What's to talk? I told those investigators everything I know. You copped out on the bookmaking charge, didn't you? Why not? They take me in, I plead guilty, pay my fine, and I'm on the street in an hour. No sweat. It's not gonna be that easy for Waverly. That fink. We used to be buddies, you know that? He told us. He did? That's right. Sure. Then it came time to put his money where his mouth is. You mean when he said he couldn't keep the heat off of you? Don't play games with me, chum. Perry Mason, you're not. You know my story. 
You stick to that fellow, and there's a good chance Phil's not only going to be kicked off the job, he's going to go to prison. Now, taking a bribe is a criminal offense. Do you know that? How about that? You ought to be glad to get rid of him. Should we? Sure. I'll tell you. I'm a civic-minded citizen. I hate to see cops hustling bribes. What's the real reason you're putting it to him? Because you think he wouldn't go to bat for you with the vice boys? My friend Phil? You must be talking about the wrong guy. He'd do anything for a friend. Ask him. He'll tell you. Just like he told me. Now look, Clover, he didn't blow the whistle on you, and you know it. He didn't even know you were making book until the night you were busted. Oh, come on, Friday. You must have read my statement. Phil knew what I was doing all right. That's not what he says. He's lying. Why would he lie? Oh, you know how it is. Guy gets in a bind, he's gonna scramble. You're really out to shoot him down, aren't you? Well, you want the truth, don't you? Yeah, but we're sure not gonna get it here, fella. Oh, hey, Friday. About getting my buddy kicked off the force? Maybe I did old Phil a favor. How do you figure? Why would anybody want to be a cop? Oh, I don't know. Why would anybody want a dead bull's ear? Friday, September 8th. The Board of Rights hearing for Officer Phil Waverly started at 9.30 a.m. The board consisted of Deputy Chief Simon, Senior Officer and Chairman of the Board, Inspector McAllister, Patrol Bureau, Captain Mack, Burglary Auto Theft, Mayor's Secretary Eva Larson was sworn in and Waverly was advised of his rights. Lieutenant Mayors called the roll of witnesses and the Chairman administered the oath. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Officer Waverly, you are charged with three counts and a complaint which I will now read to you and ask you to plead guilty or not guilty on each count. Count one, on two occasions during a period from August 9th to August 18th, 1967, in the Los Angeles area, while off duty, you improperly associated yourself with Ted Clover, a known bookmaker. How do you plead on this? Not guilty, sir. Count two, on July 30th, 1967, you, while in the company of Ted Clover, accepted from him a bribe for which you promised to attempt to prevent officers working Central Vice from interfering with Ted Clover's bookmaking activities. How do you plead? Not guilty. Count three. On August 18th, 1967, at 432 West Broadway, while off duty, when stopped and questioned by officers of this department who were conducting an official investigation, you failed and neglected to identify yourself as a police officer. How do you plead? Guilty, sir. Ten thirty-six a.m., Mayor's first witnesses were the vice officers who had made the arrest, Sergeants Ward and Vaughn. They both told exactly the same story. They'd seen Waverly with Ted Clover twice. They saw Clover give Waverly some money. Their testimony was deadly. 2.46 p.m., Ted Clover was the first witness when the hearing reconvened after lunch. He was impressive. Mr. Clover, why would you tell him you were a bookmaker? You knew he was a police officer. Well, that's the reason I did it. Phil and I are old friends. I figured he'd find out eventually, so I thought I might as well level with him right off. That way he could make up his own mind about me continuing as a friend of his. And that's when he said he could help you with the vice officers? If I loaned him some money, yes, sir. That's what he said. If I loaned him some money. Did you lend him the money? Yes, sir. Fifty dollars worth. Let's get that straight, Mr. Clover. You paid Officer Waverly, sorry, you loaned Officer Waverly fifty dollars in return for his promise to help keep the vice officers away from you. That is right. I have no further questions. Cross. Mr. Clover, you're quite positive about the amount of this loan, as you call it. No chance it could have been more than $50 or less. No chance. Got it all down in my account book. Oh, you mean you have this transaction in writing? Well, I'd like to keep track of where my money goes. I wonder if I could see your account book, Mr. Clover. I don't think so. It's personal property. Mr. Chairman, the witness claims to have written proof of an act for which Officer Waverly may be dismissed from his job. Now, if that's true, the defense has every right to see that proof. We agree, Sergeant. Mr. Clover, will you give the book you spoke about to Sergeant Friday? No chance. It belongs to me, and it's got nothing to do with this case. And besides, it won't do you or Waverly any good. Mr. Clover, this board is interested in one thing and one thing only, the truth. As long as there's a chance that book will help us get that truth, you're directed to produce it. It's in code. I told you it wouldn't do any good. I don't know what you expect to gain by these tactics, Mr. Clover, but this board insists on your cooperation. You made me give him the book. 
But you can't make me remember how the code works. I just forgot. Sergeant Friday, if the board will agree to recess now, maybe you and Lieutenant Mayors can assist Mr. Clover by breaking his code. Yes, sir. Advise the board when you're ready to resume. Yes, sir. We'd like an hour. This hearing is recessed and will reconvene in one hour. We returned to Lieutenant Mayor's office. We called in an expert, Sergeant Hugh Binion of the Administrative Vice Division, a specialist in bookmakers and their operations. Looks familiar. I'd guess it's some kind of number letter transposition code. That's what I figured. You just write down the alphabet from A to Z, then number each letter from 1 to 26. When you want to write down a number, you change it to the corresponding letter and change letters you want to put in code into numbers. Simple. This marker here shows the action Clover was taking. The bets seem to be written in clear. For the rest of it, we switch the numbers to letters and letters to numbers, and that should give us the names of his clients, the horses, tracks, and races. That KN at the top could mean 11-14 or November 14th. What do you mean by could? Well, if Clover was being cute, he might have added or subtracted a key number in transposing. For example, say he was using a key of some kind, then the letter A would be 1 plus his key number. Well, how do we work that out, Hugh? Trial and error. Got an idea, though. You say Clover claims he gave Waverly 50 bucks. That's right. Now, let's see if we can find that entry and work backwards, right? Here's something might be it on his weekly O sheet. This is kind of interesting. What's that? Found an entry 50 bucks even. Only one in here. Thing is, Clover's taking it off his net take instead of his gross. Well, what's that mean? Don't know, but if it's juice, a bribe, it seems more likely he'd take it off his gross, wouldn't he? Could be some kind of personal item. What kind of personal item? Look here, right after this $50 entry, two initials, P.W. Phil Waverly. While Binion and Mayers continued working on the code in Clover's book, Bill and I met with Waverly in an interrogation room on the third floor. Well, have you got any explanation for that $50 item in Clover's book? How could I? Now, look, Waverly, don't ask us how we know. Just write it down as a hunch. You sometimes get them in this racket. I got one now that says you're holding back. You're not telling us everything you know about this. Look, I don't know anything about his book or his lousy code. That's not what we're asking you. We're asking you if a $50 personal item in that book means anything to you, does it? Look, it wasn't a bribe, I swear to you. He was just paying back what he owed me. He owed you $50? Come on, spit it out. The night we were discharged from the service, we had a crap game in the barracks. I won a couple hundred bucks. Ted was tapped out, so I loaned him 50 to get home. I forgot all about it till just the other night when he paid it back. Why didn't you tell us this before? Would you have believed me? You didn't give us a chance. Well, I'm telling you the truth now, whether you believe it or not. So help me, I'm telling you the truth. You know something, Waverly? Yeah? You're beginning to sound like a broken record. Four oh five p.m., the hearing reconvened. Ted Clover was recalled for cross-examination. I'd like to remind you you're still under oath. Sergeant Friday. Now, Mr. Clover, I'm going to ask you once more if you'll tell us how the code in this notebook reads. See, I still don't remember. But you do remember that you bribed Officer Waverly. Don't put words in my mouth. I said I loaned him $50. Isn't that what I said? I know what you said, but Officer Waverly is being charged with accepting a bribe. That's his problem. All right. Will you identify this notebook as the same one you gave me an hour ago? It's mine. Will you tell us if anything in it has been changed? Any erasures, additions, deletions? Looks all right. Bill. Gentlemen, with the assistance of Sergeant Binion of Advice, Mr. Clover's code is now readable. It seems that Clover gave each letter of the alphabet a number. Then he added three as a key number. I call your attention to the blackboard. You will see a single entry copied from his betting marker for August 11th this year. Officer Gannon will indicate the various points. By decoding, we find that someone named Pat made a $10 bet to win on horse number four in the third race at Aqueduct on August 11th. Later in Mr. Clover's notes, we find that Pat, whoever he is, was paid off on this particular bet. I have here the racing results for August 11th. It shows Red Fox, the horse in post position number four, won the third race at Aqueduct on that day. Am I right so far, Mr. Clover? It's your blackboard. That's your code, Clover, and you're lying when you say you bribed Officer Waverly. Can you prove the witness is lying, Sergeant Friday? Yes, sir, I think I can. On this page is an entry involving Officer Waverly and $50. That's what I said. I gave him $50. No, not exactly. The actual text of the entry is PW50 21-19-7 line 15-17. Now, this particular entry translates as follows. PW50 RPD line LN or Phil Waverly $50 repaid loan. 
Now, I submit that there was no bribe involved here, but rather repayment of money owed to Officer Waverly. Money lost in a dice game by this witness, Ted Clover, while he was in service with the accused, Phil Waverly. Isn't that correct, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover, is that correct? I never should have given you that book. You had no right. Is this board to assume from your last statement that Sergeant Friday's analysis is correct? Answer the question, Mr. Clover. All right, all right. That's correct. Well, you cops really stick together and protect one another, don't you? We're going to go further than that, Mr. Clover. Lieutenant Mayors, I direct you to forward an entire transcript of this hearing, together with this board's findings, to the District Attorney of the County of Los Angeles. This board will recommend that office institute and press charges against this witness for the felonious offense of perjury. One last thing, Mr. Clover. Yeah, what's that? You made a remark about policemen sticking together to protect one another. It's true, you do. Yes, that seems to be the generally accepted myth by those whose main energies are spent defying constituted law and authority. But your statement is only a half-truth. We're also sworn to protect the citizen, even to the point of placing our lives on the line to do it. I'm one of those citizens that pays your salary, mister. In your case, Mr. Clover, I promise you I'm going to earn it. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 11th, the Board of Rights of the Los Angeles Police Department concluded the case of Officer Philip Waverly. In a moment, the results of that board's findings. The board found the accused not guilty of counts one and two, associating with a known bookmaker and accepting a bribe from same. The board found the accused guilty on the third count, failure to identify himself as a police officer. Philip Waverly was suspended from his position as policeman for a period of 45 days with a total loss of pay amounting to $1,000. Ted Clover was subsequently tried and convicted on a charge of perjury. Perjury is punishable by imprisonment